All right. <sighs> I'm Josh, check. Josh sent us some goldfish. He did, yes. And, um, I'm going to check both your teeth in a second and make bro, sure you don't go goldfish all in them. He's got two types. May likes traditional. Rob likes the extra powder. Yeah. So. so thank you, Josh. Again, you have now fed three different people with your goldfish. Yeah. Was that that massive carton I saw? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. also Where's the normal one, by the way? Where did that end up? I put it up on the counter. Oh. Uh, up on the, above the cabinet. I can't reach that. Well, I'll get it for you when you want it. I thought you were going to eat the normal. It turns out you don't like the powdery ones. I like them. They're fine. They're good. They're just not as good as the normal ones. Oh, my God. This is like how our podcasts go. <laughs> All right, y'all want me to do a teeth check? How's your, how's your mouth? Open your mouth. Open your mouth. That's not a good way of opening. Thank you. You good? Yeah, I can't tell. Yeah, I don't, anyway. I don't smile. Yeah, that's fine. Luckily, you've got the mustache. You can Neither hide whatever ones, things yeah. you no. want in your mouth. But even if I didn't have it, I still don't smile with my teeth. I yeah, just, I don't my gums don't go that way. All right. Um, next question. Did British soldiers, um, soldiers, soldiers, did British soldiers armed with black powder rifles have part of their water ration set aside specifically for cleaning the fouling? No, that's what pee's for. Pee does <laughs> clean a lot of things. <laughs> um, uh, uh, no, I, there's no I don't specific... think there'd be a good reason to do that. No, I mean, it, you've your got, water you, ration. You've, you've got a water bottle. Yeah. And water was used in cleaning, but. In certain circumstances, I suppose you'd have to, mm. but w the, bl the the question sort of speaks to a like a formal doctrinal kind of piece. Like you will always have a quarter of your bottle left for cleaning your rifle. That was never the case. Well, they specifically say armed with black powder firearms. Right. So we're talking about you know that era. No, that's what pee's for. You just pee in yeah. it. Yeah, that's the that's the way to go about that's it. That's our new yeah. marketing thing. Remember? Yeah, just yeah, I know with ballast <laughs> just on pee it. on it's it. It's better than peeing in it. <laughs> Oh my God. Anyway, uh, next question. And we've arrived at that part of the yeah. video. <laughs> We're not even to the, the, the fun questions. Um, did the British copyright the list of changes for their arms? And if so, why? I yes. had to look up the list of changes to yes. know what that was before we started this. Yes, they are copyright. And who was just talking about this recently? Was it? I think it was Ian. Yeah, he was oh, crying about it. Oh, maybe that's why this question yeah. got asked. Then. And so Ian, Ian was all like, I can't know things because I'd have to read. <laughs> Oh my god, he's gonna watch this. I know he's gonna watch it. That's why I did it. I'm gonna text you later. Um, you guys don't understand. You have to read so many books to know things. <laughs> I'll stand over here when the lightning bolt hits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, they are corporated. Uh, you, you have to. The one, the, the Ian Skeleton versions of the list of changes have been literally transcribed and published, which is a way. My understanding is is the way that he's got around that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you no. Know? I mean, I imagine it's because still, he's, they're published. If it's copyrighted, then wouldn't it still just be plagiarism, like straight? Well, up? apparently, and this was—I think this was—Jonathan mentioned the same sort of thing when I visited with him yeah. earlier in the year. Was that you know you can't reproduce, but you literally can transcribe, and that's okay. And it, it, maybe it was a question of they're allowing to do that. I don't know how Ian Skennerton who okay wait, why, the list of changes. who's selling them? No, it's just a governmental thing, right? They're so they're copyrighted. copyrighted. Yeah. Then who's selling? Because the whole point of copywriting is to protect it from being essentially pirated. Mm -hmm. You're, it, the only reason to copyright is a financial protection. So you would want to have a monopoly on the ability to sell them. I know, you, you, but they're not selling them. You can maybe inquire in terms of why. This is such a, it's such a weird thing because in the U.S., you know, it's considered taxpayer money to do this stuff. So mm -hmm. none of it's copyright. Like all the U.S. stuff, like all the all the. Um, Government documents, the training films, all that stuff. None of it can be copyrighted because it belongs to the people. Mm -hmm. right. So, like, one of, the, one of the things that U.S. does pretty well is that. Also, Library of Congress is pretty dope. Like, our, our U.S. archival is so much nicer than, like, European archival. Right. I mean, not that they don't know how to run their archives, but just everything has a surcharge and a headache attached to it over there. And, and for some reason here, it's just like, well, if you ask, it's free. We'll do it, you know. Mm -hmm. So It just takes time. Yeah. If that. So the thing, the list of changes is a very exhaustive document that talks about everything military, right. from shoes to, you know, buttons to rifles to... And butt plates. Everything. <laughs> and butt plates. So, uh, like, the Skenderton version and his volumes of the list of changes are a abridged version that he hand-selected what he wanted to republish. So it doesn't have every single entry, just right. the ones that are pertaining to basically weapons, hmm. right? So, hmm. and equipment associated with them. Okay. So they are available in terms of that form. How do you borrow the entire thing? You have to go there. 
Is it one book? Well, a massive tome. I can of this. I was trying to say, like, it's got to be like they had to have done multiple publications of the list. They did, yeah. So, so. I, I don't know how and what they look like in their original form. Right. Although I've, I've seen, like, there are photo uh, copies. And, oh, that's and illegal. That's totally illegal. <laughs> you know, there are, I have seen some specifics that yeah. appear to be purely doctrine. What a strange doctrine. thing to have uh, locked out. Jonathan will know, right, Jonathan? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, which one of these three guns would you carry into World War II as your sidearm? In field number two, Webley Mark IV... Or Smith and Wesson MP, MMP. Enfield Mark II. Yeah, Enfield Number Two. Wait, Enfield, Number Two. Yes, it's Number Two specifically. Hold on, this is confusing. What war is this? Uh, World War. If you're going into World War Two. Oh, two. And you can only pick one of those three Enfield as your Enfield Number Two, Webley Mark IV. Or mm-hmm. Smith and Wesson MMP. One like that. Is that a thirty-eight? What is that? What that one? Yeah, that's a thirty-eight. That's yeah. the Webley. That'd be the. Um, Webley Mark IV. Mm-hmm. I'd probably go to the Smith & Wesson. That's what I was thinking. I did the research earlier on this. Yeah, it's just a K-frame yet. Smith & Wesson. I'd do that. Yeah. Also, it'd probably get special. You could get 38 special. Yeah. Well, I guess he's probably thinking that it'd be a 38200. 38200. Like yeah, that's what he specified. I'd go to the Smith & Wesson. Yeah. I've never here. found top rakes to... Like, I love top rakes conceptually, but I've just never found them to hold up as well as just a solid frame with a swing out. Yeah. And also, they're smoother. And Rob, do you have strong opinions on revolvers? I have uh, <laughs> only when I have to shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to our project, I have all of those available right now. Where you could compare them. <laughs> it depends on which one hip shoots the best. Yeah, right. <laughs> dun, 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 I will say the K frame's way smoother. Like it's it the, is, not yeah. that the Webleys are bad, but like the the K frame is a very smooth gun by comparison. Mm-hmm. All right, it's July nineteen eighteen okay. at the Second Battle of the Marne. Okay. The Canadians and the Americans are fighting together in the summer offensive against the Germans. Adias, you are a Canadian soldier. And Rob, you are an American soldier. Okay. What weapons would your homeland want you, or would you want in the battle? Artillery. Lots yeah, that's and lots artillery. Of artillery. Yeah. <laughs> and tanks. And more artillery. And machine guns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good, actually. All good exercise. It's 1918? Yeah, 1918. July. I mean, by then, I might even be able to get the Browning in the service. Oh, yeah, that's true. Like, the good stuff was showing up by then. Well, it, it'd be funny you picked July because... Um, well, he specifically very- says, Athias is Canadian and you're American, yeah. so you can't... Would you be able to get the Browning as Canadian boy? No, but I might be able to get Lewis. Oh, yeah, maybe. That's possible. Yeah, I get, like, the Lewis and the Lee Enfield. It's not any rifle choices. Not really. I not. mean, I personally prefer a P-14, but they didn't issue them in the front. They're mm-hmm. a reserve rifle. I mean, they, they never got set up front, but I actually do prefer the, the P-14 to the engine. Sorry. <laughs> I like the aperture sight. Quite frankly, in terms of what warfare was like in 1918, doesn't matter what rifle. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> <laughs> At all. <laughs> all right. You are both British officers purchasing your own revolver in 450 Adams at the tail end of its use. What are you choosing? And it's in 450 Adams only, and that's the only cartridge he wants you to pick from. I haven't purchased 450 Adams. Help. I, I don't help. Have yeah, I was going to say, I need a bit of help here. It's the price, probably, then. What's commonly available in the market is the yeah. price is the most reliable in the market at that point. Adams Mark III wouldn't have been bad. Yeah, but that's, that's just the Adams. It's that big, heavy, single loader. Mm-hmm. The price is the sort of the first of the top breaks. You pinch both sides and you break it okay, away. Right. And then it, it influences the Webley. The um, I would almost want to say the Trantor 1879, because the Trantor 1879 is the first one that has that stirrup latch, and you pop right, it open okay. and everything. Mm-hmm. But the problem is the lock work. There are some early prices, especially the Codes, that are already using the Fanu lock work. Yeah, with that rebounding hammer. And the fun, yeah, and the having the, well, there was a there's a rebounding hammer in the seventy nine. That's not the problem. This is something that people don't understand is that revolvers are multi threaded uh, by their very design, whereas most semi autos are not mm-hmm. multi threaded. Um, if you think about a semi auto, you pull the trigger and all it really does is it either releases the hammer or releases the firing pin. You mm-hmm. know, and if it's the hammer, the hammer releases, it hits the firing pin. The firing pin hits the primer. The gun, the the, the cartridge goes boom. And then the recoil causes this thing to happen, which causes that thing to happen, which causes this thing to happen. It's very sequential, right? right. It's very linear. With a revolver, you pull the trigger, 
well, let's say double action is what we're really talking about here. You pull the trigger and two things start happening at once. That hammer starts camming back and the cylinder starts rotating. Mm -hmm. And they must reach Congress at the same moment. You know what I mean? Like, it's and that's if you're be... assuming it's only those two things. There could also be some sort of like cylinder stop. This, this, this is where I'm going. This is where I'm going. So or... um, the, big, the big reason for the what we are calling the Marriott lock work thanks to Mueller's work, the big reason it's so preferred is that it doesn't have a separate seer for single action. The separate seer for single action that you see in a tranter, let's say, represents a problem mechanically because it's a third thread. In other words, you're not just trying to push the hammer back and the cylinder rotate and have them come together at the same time. You also have to have the hammer go back and the trigger tip, tip the seer at just the right moment to allow the hammer to come forward and not catch at the half cock or something like that. You right. know? And so that, that seer element introduces a whole other thing that must be timed to the other two. And it's when a we're whole doing these massive layer right. added of complication. So the thing is, I'm, I'm a little unsure. I do believe the Kone made Belgian revolvers that were available in the market at the time. I do believe they were using Fanu Lockworks already, which means auto rebounding hammer and the Mariette system, which is that the single action is just the lower arm clicks up, and the double action is that that arm catches the nose, and then that does not require independent timing of another component. Right. Um, and therefore doesn't wear out nearly as bad. Um, and I know this is getting very nuanced, but that's just why that's such a preferred system is why I'm going way too deep. But my point being is if I can have a fun new style lock work with a quick loading mechanism available in the commercial market, that's probably going to be, uh, you know, available in any numbers. It's going to be what is it commonly called the price. Although this has its own problems. The prices are actually the ones that have a locking bolt that prevent rotation when the gun is not being shot. That tends to be the defining feature. The price patent is a locking bolt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kone's tend to not have that feature, at really? least that early. Oh, okay. um, and so the problem is you're going, what we call the price is actually the Kone patent. And what the actual price patent is in Britain is just that locking bolt, which is a nice feature. But it also comes a little later than you're thinking, and it usually comes with a tranter style lock work instead of a Fanu style. So is but there not one always, that's got the Kone because there's so many manufacturers. With the original price with right. the Marriott. Most people just look at what they call they look at the double pinch pop opens and they go, "Oh, it's a price," and you're like, mm, "There's actually like at least three that are that I've identified as like main lines of this this okay. tack." And so, so is there a magical? Oh. Um, missing link in there that has possibly still got the original price lock work, but with that Kone um, locking bolt. I don't know. I, I, I haven't gotten that deep yet. Uh, by the later series, yes, because it seems like that that's how the Fanyu gets introduced to Webley, is that Webley is working in this price realm, mm -hmm. and the a lot of the Kone style ones are coming over. I know I have an a Kone. I have a Kone marked Kone mm -hmm. that clearly has a Fanyu style block work in it. And so that's probably that when the Belgian idea of the Fanyu really came over and solidified in Webley, went, ooh, because they're already making this this derivative of the price. So, um, which I believe they called the number four? I can't mm -hmm. remember now. Anyway, because Webley starts using the Fanyu lock work image. I mean, that's what's in that gun. So, um... If I can, I'd get a Fanny lock work with a break open action on a price pattern. And even then, there's iterative issues because it's when they start testing these price style firearms, it's noted that, because uh, I saw it in some of the documentation for the Enfield, is that, you know, there's an uh, officer that came forward that said, hey, just my gun's better, just shoot it. And they said, well, actually, mechanically, it's great, but on target, it sucks because it's just, it's not sighted right, it's, the barrel quality is not as good, whatever the case may be. And so there's, there's going to be differences in rifling and things that give you better performance out of those guns as well. But if I'm stuck with 450, I'm probably going to go with a, a top break rebounding hammer. So I'd say either a price type or a um, uh, Tranter 1879. Those sure. would be the two big ones. Fair. Sorry, that was a lot of lecture. No, that's I okay. think Rob would agree. It's a murky area. <laughs> what he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very murky commercial era. And so just refresh my memory in terms of when does the 450 Adams era end? Uh, 1881-ish. Because the problem is they adopt the Enfield, but they, the 476 isn't... Well, it's not even 476. Right. There's guys that will yell about that. But the Enfield Mark I cartridge was rapidly abandoned. 455. Five. And they had to come up with the Mark II. And while they're coming up with the Mark II, they're like, well, we'll temporarily issue Adams with these. Okay. And so there's this brief period where you have the new gun with the old cartridge... And then they come out with the Mark II, and it takes time for the commercial market to catch back up to that. But I still say there's some preparation there because you see these long cylindered guns still available in the commercial market. Mm -hmm. 
during this transition phase. So it's very interesting. I'm, I'm really curious what Enfield was signaling or what the government was signaling behind the scenes. Because the, when the Trantor 79's design, the Trantor 78's design, all this stuff before the, the, the new cartridge comes out, all of them have cylinders long enough to take up to a 45 Colt. And they can all, they're all rated for it, essentially. It's just that they're not bored out to those dimensions. Okay. And so it looks like all the manufacturers are like, let's go ahead and set up as if the British government's going to adopt 45 Colt, because then we can adapt to anything in between. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a lot of talk about, at the time, there was a lot of talk comparing 450 atoms to 45 Colt. Colt was shown as, over and over and over again as this much superior handgun around. It was a big part of kicking their butt into getting it into 476, which still wasn't even seen as a great cartridge. Mm. But anyway, the, 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 then you see this longer cartridge come out, and surprise, surprise, it fits in everything, and you're going... It's interesting that they were already pre-positioned with having the right cylinder length because, especially like Webley afterwards, you see them make guns specifically for 450 because 450 stated police cartridge, and those are like short cylindered. And in the 1880s, they're making little short cylinders specifically for 450 atoms for police use. Mm-hmm. And you're going, yeah, they could have done that the whole time, you know? Right. But. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's take a pause for the cameras. Okay. Yeah, you have to be way over here at this one. The things we go oh, to. They're fine. They're not, they're never been. Is it the one-eyed one? <laughs> I'll show you one later. Really? <laughs> no, you already showed yours. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Next question. It is 1866, and you are moving to the West. I'm assuming it can be the West in Canada or the West in the United States for both of you. Okay. Uh, which rifle do you carry, or would you carry? It's grizzly country, and you have a horse. So 1866... It's they're bears and you have a horse to at least ride on. Not my era. <laughs> no. Uh, do you have any opinions? Uh, it, it's kind of outside my genre, being a kind of a civilian application. Yeah, that's right? true. So you couldn't even have your snipe. Uh, I mean, technically, it's the 1866 is it attached to the Snyder, but it doesn't even come into military service until '67. Yeah, really. So you just so, order one. You just write a letter, <laughs> and one shows up. And this this brand new ammunition that's never really yeah, been. yeah. <laughs> I guess this assumes we're packing in our ammo. Yeah, yeah I'm thinking so. Yes. Be. There's no hope of getting resupplied out no. there easily, um, unless and in that case we got to fight for like having very specific cartridges. Blah 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 blah. blah I'm blah, assuming blah. you're going out there to start a new life, essentially. So you got all your stuff on. I'm bringing horse like with a you. thousand rounds with me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> your poor horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? I mean, a Hudson Bay trade gun would be something that you would end up seeing. Right. Mm-hmm. And would you be able to get the components for an ammunition for that? I mean, they're selling them. It'd almost be safer to go with a muzzle-loading rifle right. mm-hmm. in, in a lot of ways. But the problem is then you don't have any follow-up shooting ability. No. One shot, you hope the bear goes down or away. And the other piece is that, that your protection of your ammunition in terms of the environment is going to be harder. Minimal, yeah. Right? No, commer- Whereas if we're talking about a cartridge rifle, then... The strongest commercially available rifle I would know would be the Peabody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which was a very strong lock work. It's just, you know, the hammer turned out to be unnecessary. They, they We saw with the Martini. Mm-hmm. But, like, that is an extremely robust rifle. I I would probably trust that one. I think, yeah, probably Peabody is the probably the closest. I can't think now. We did that episode. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember when they became really commercially available. Because they tried marketing it during the war, and then they started doing their own tulip in production. But I don't remember when they were really, really selling that that Peabody. I don't remember either. But it was right about that time. Yeah. I feel like you probably could have gotten one in your hands in 66. I can see that. If you went to go buy one and bought the ammo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, another question. It's 1905. You're responsible for um, capability development in your respective war offices slash departments. Okay. The Second Boer War and recent Russo-Japanese War have given you some pointers to what the future may have in store, but it's far from clear. Um, given the technology of the day, so 1905, what one dismounted uh, close combat capability would you want have wanted developed um, to have the greatest impact in the future Great War to come? Those are two totally different conflicts is the problem. <clears throat> if you're looking at the Rus- the Russo-Japanese War was a much better indicator of what was going to happen in World War One. Um, way, way, way. 100%. Better. Because those both had, they had both sides using machine guns. 
Mm-hmm. And both sides struggled to approach emplaced machine guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also they both had some use of artillery and things like that. But uh, we're talking about you know infantry weapons. Right. And so if you were smart enough to say, hey, machine guns are pretty frigging dangerous. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Then I think... The and this requires a lot. See, this is the problem. Is you wouldn't know at the time. It'd be very hard to be smart enough to figure this out at the time. Right. But in retrospect, we know that the way to beat a machine gun in World War One was to have a light machine gun and a handful of guys with grenades. Like you, right. you, you would pin and flank with grenades. That's all you do. Like you just drop your shosha, pump rounds into the spot where you know the machine gun is. And then guys cut left and right, huck their grenades in there, blow the nest, and then you move up. You know, that, that was, became the strategy. Mm-hmm. So, I guess light machine gun? Like, that's that, the, the light machine gun's probably the way to go. In terms of, and by the way, it was available. I mean, the, the Madsen light machine gun that we shot for Project Lightning is a model 1905, you know? Right. It, it was there to be had. And then, uh, I believe the portative was on the way at that point, too. And so there, there, there only takes so much evolution to get a working one in order. The bigger thing, though, is understanding that you could just quick swap the barrel. That's the part everybody kind of goofed up at first, is they're too busy trying to cool them and didn't realize that you could just swap the barrel. Right. So. Okay. Well, uh, next question. You are making a bug out bag for the apocalypse. What gun are you putting in your bag? I'm assuming this is a bag that you could... Decide what size you think is a good... It's the apocalypse. Yeah. Okay, what's your bug out gun for the apocalypse? I mean, is the apocalypse of a certain time period? I don't know if it's an apocalypse that requires me to wander around with a back. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a hunker down apocalypse. I gotta go move around apocalypse. Yeah, so it's one that you are are having to transition from time to time. Or live in the woods apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I pick the woods personally. Am I hiding the woods? Because that changes the answer, right? Yeah, I guess it depends on your terrain and, and what kind of apocalypse. Are, yeah, are, when, are, are we coming after? When you? is this apocalypse? It was in was this in like you know eighteen hundreds or yeah. like when did the apocalypse happen? I'm just trying to think. What's the most useful? I'm thinking if I can only have one firearm, like a shotgun. With a mixture of shot. And oh slug. yeah, that's a good utility, but mm-hmm. your range is very limited even with slug. Well, I mean, so I guess maybe for hunting purposes, like for long range, you know, getting a deer or something. Let's for just yourself. say, what's this apocalypse all about? Oh yeah, or I the deer like if mutants. it's a survivability thing, shotgun easy because you, your range of ammo is so. That's, that's what I'd say. Mm-hmm. And the, are you going to find it in some village that you, it's emptied and you're foraging through it you might find or, a box of something do you have to go it? by what you currently have stocked in your household so if you if like a, say whatever you have ammo wise in your house right now would that be what you go off of no because I have so much leftover steel 30-06 thanks Ian <laughs> yeah <laughs> I have so much would you like some steel case 30-06 no, no, Ian no <laughs> see um, not great because <laughs> like the air service to me are just going out of the woods <laughs> Uh, yeah, the most utility comes from the shotgun. Easily. Yeah, that's that's what I. Although, ooh, tend to go. Ooh, you know, what would be a good one then. Is the uh, they made those um, oh crap, was it Marlin that made those over unders that are like, you can get a thirty thirty like a, like a drilling kind of. Yeah, yeah, it's a single barrel shotgun that either in twelve or twenty, I can't remember, oh. but one of the chambers is the thirty thirty. Okay, so you have a single shot thirty thirty. And a single shot shotgun in right. one like I mean they did them all sorts of they did mostly twenty two LR right. and twenty gauge, but there was a version where you could get like a thirty thirty and twelve or twenty. Well, they'd... that'd be a good one, just an over over there with a single shot thirty thirty. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. All right, um, let's see here. Can you imagine an alternative universe where the Winchester lever action made it to Rourke's drift? That is really specific. Yeah. Do you think he thinks can you about imagine this that? laying at night yeah, in his bed? Sure. Well, sure. I mean, okay. He can imagined I, it. Can I imagine? No, sh- it? imagine. 18 it. Tip, I'm Stop. trying. Stop. Close your eyes. Okay. Okay, your work's drift? Mm-hmm. What are they holding? Your buddy. <laughs> oh. That's so cute. Um Are they holding Winchesters? No, they're not. Oh, he can't imagine it. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that he picked Works Drift. Because I think that the, or she who asked the question, is indicating that there could have been a different result given, if, given a different yeah. weapon. 
Right. Rourke's Direction was an overwhelming victory for the British. So did they require a short-range repeating rifle? I if they won with what they had. Overwhelmingly. Mm-hmm. That's mm. that's where my mind went with that question. Maybe they're thinking the earlier thing. Island Duana? Yeah. Which is clearly not Rourke's Drift. <laughs> yeah, I know. But maybe that's what they're thinking about. Right, or maybe. I don't <clears throat> think that they, that battle was won through maneuver. Okay. Huh. If you were an infantryman of the British Empire in the First World War and had a choice between carrying the P-14 or the smelly number one Mark III for use on the Western Front, which would you choose and why? I believe you answered this previously with us. I mean, I like the B-14. Right. But putting Rob on the spot here. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, he's most familiar with the smelly. Sure. Yeah. I mean, he's the most familiar with it. it, it ultimately, in the big picture, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And that's my sort of take on that whole subject. Look, he's not going to pick. He can't do it. You're going to make him pick. But if I'm going to pick, <laughs> I personally, I'll take I'll take the SMLE. Yeah, that's because you got ten rounds. The ten rounds ten make round it better. Magazine, that will win the war. Yeah, yeah. ten rounds. Ten rounds. Round. Because you could argue you have more experience with it. You know it more. Well, the same way that a stronger action will win the war. Oh. No, a stronger action don't shoot more fast. <laughs> you don't understand. You don't even... It's semi-automatic. <laughs> is that what it's you got to shoot. You can do the mad minute. If everybody does the mad minute, and then they you win. just win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. You got to do the mad All minute. All the mad minutes. <laughs> Ten rounds, mad minute. <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is Ross Mark III. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Um, do you feel that the Pattern 13 infield in 276 would have been an improvement for the British Army had they had the time to adopt it? I mean, the action's stronger. But like, imp- improving to what? Can, like, what are they improving? You know, I guess I, I'm not just speculating. What would you say? Would it have been? I think we kind of covered this though, like with the 380 yeah. Ross thing, like sure. a similar yeah. problem, it's which exactly. is that like, do, do you need that? No, it turns can, out they didn't that need capability? that capability. So the cartridge wasn't needed. Let's mm. skip that for a second, then, because it turns out combined arms accounts for that better than the cartridge does. Mm-hmm. Then it just becomes this. The, it's basically the same question as was the P14 better than Smelly. It's the same question in, in a different set of clothes, as long as you discount the cartridge. Right. So. Honestly, the only thing I could see 276 doing better than 303 is being fed by machine guns. There's a bit of wackiness in terms of British machine guns at first trying to deal with the rimmed round. That's true. Um, it does fine in the Maxim derived guns with some modification, but then trying to work up light machine guns, I mean, the portative is bizarre. The Lewis gun uses a super bizarre feed system that is honestly its Achilles heel. Um, in terms of the double feeds and stuff. Oh, yeah, those are fun. You never um, actually got to experience that, did you, Rob? No, it, no, it didn't actually it ran, do it on him. Apart from the breakages of yeah. parts, it ran pretty fast. Amazing. Out of all the things that Yeah, we were happened. getting double feeds like crazy before, but that didn't happen this time. <laughs> okay, yeah. So. Different stuff every time. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, um, the only real advantage to going off of the rim is the real, it's coming off the rim cartridge so that you can get a better machine gun development program, but it doesn't yeah. seem like they, the, the British weirdly did the best out of all the rimmed machine gun guys where they're just like, okay, we got rims. We have to figure out how to make these work, you know? Sure. Yeah. And then the next question kind of goes sort of about the P-13. Well, it does go about P-13 as again. Um, they th- want to know. like the P-13. <laughs> had war just, not been just, declared. Just, can't have it. So right. had, had the Great War not occurred, do you think the P-13 would have replaced the Smelly? In terms of its actual production. Well, that, that was what the intent had been. Right. Yeah. To develop it in the first place. Yeah. So but did that program it, reach final acceptance? Uh, and before. Before the smelly. Or re- well, it says no, they, basically before, replacing before, the smelly. Right. What did, did, right. You know, we had that talk about going over the hill. Mm-hmm. The question is how close to the peak do you think it was? Right. That's before, good the, before war. the war. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think? I don't think it was there yet. I don't. It, my thing is, I think it was still past my knuckles. Like, mm-hmm. I think it was down here, as far as I've been able to tell. I don't, I haven't found the big name that was supposed to put it. Now, it could have happened, but it just, I don't know. I don't. Mm-hmm. Right. Honestly, the most significant thing that happened that gun was the fact that it was easier to produce and therefore got sent over to America. So, had it been a P10, yeah. not a P14 or P13. Right. That may have had that extra bit of time. Mm-hmm. Before the war, you mean? Before. 
Or had it been a, like a... No, no, but they're saying assume World War One never happened. Yeah, they're to, saying had oh. war never be, not been declared. In, in, oh, okay, if the, war, it, if the first World War never happened, do you think the yeah. P-13 right. would have made it to adoption? Yeah. What do you think? I mean, it's possible the need for 303 or a larger caliber might not have been I mean, the obsession was there. Like, unless something happened... The problem is, the other aspect is, even without World War One, if there was another conflict that proved that war was getting closer together, mm-hmm. or there were other artillery developments that they became aware of, they mm-hmm. might have said, hold on, do we really need this range? But would there right. have been someone stubborn enough to push for that to happen? Because as know, you well, mentioned the before, financial... there's been a lot of instances in which <laughs> does someone deciding, no, this is happening, this is a good idea, would tip it over the edge to continue it on further right. than what I'm it needed hesitant to. to think that it would. I'm hesitant to think it would have worked, because we see no one... I mean, not actually, maybe no one. I can't think of a single country that changed cartridges in that period significantly. Mm-hmm. Um, we already did talk about the point of the, the training. Right. And the fact that, in fact, the training ranges were decreasing. Right. Moving forward towards European warfare. Right. So whether the war happened then or it happened five years from now. Yeah, there's already that mindset well, it that it was kind of coming it's, back. The mindset's already there. That's where the threat was going in towards the war. Now, if... Again, the nuance of the question, if the war didn't happen, did the lead-in to the war never happen? Right. That's right? the game. Mm-hmm. And if the lead-in didn't happen, then they would have been stuck. The only experience they would have had to... Was to, the Velt. Was the Velt. But no, 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 because they still could have observed... They could have observed the Russo-Japanese. They right. could have observed the Balkan Wars. They could have observed a number of different transactions happening mm-hmm. that would have maybe made up their minds. It, it would really depend. It would depend on if anybody... Boy, that's hard. What about like the Italian or Turkish war? No, there's not enough there to really get some meat off of that. It would really depend. It would depend on if anything, anything came along to stop them. I don't know how close they were to adoption of the P-13. Yeah. It still seems a little bit like a concept car when you look at it. You're going, you these finger grooves, this other stuff, it's a little too buck wild. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Best I can give it is 50-50. I, I, I do not know, actually. That's fair. All right, let's take a pause with the cameras. Yeah. And then look. Look. Look like that. Okay. Okay. You, Matthias and Mm -hmm. and or Rob, are a loyal British subject. (laughs) I'm not, but okay. (laughs) It is early to mid days of World War I. Uh You have volunteered to serve and you are being kitted out to go to the front. Okay. Is there any rifle put to this purpose at this time that you would discard at the first chance to upgrade? Yeah, the Ross. Which they did. Which yeah. I'm assuming you're... Yeah, yeah, Ross. Okay, yeah. 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 I mean, going, pretty into easy. It, going into it, the average guy perhaps didn't wasn't aware. Yeah. He had to go through a, a, a rather significant I mean, yeah, emotional a of, event, for to quote a phrase, to but no, have that No, I'd been like, I don't want that first generation Ross, you know. Right. You know, I'd take like a. I mean, ultimately, it discard it for what? What's available to you? Soldiers for the don't first really, chance to upgrade. Soldiers don't really think like that. Like this is junk. I'm gonna pick up something else as soon as I get there. Right. Without any demonstrative, you know, um, uh, aspect of it that would cause you to think that. Which the only thing that's that demonstrative have. is if you're going from a single shot to something that actually has a damn magazine. Sure. But, but have, n- where nobody's was that? In, nobody's no. in that kind of yeah. paradigm, right? I mean, that would be the most obvious kind of thing where if I was handed something, I'd be like, oh, this is obviously one round. And that's obviously more than one. I'm going to go with the more than one. That, that'd be the way I would think. But there's nothing like that. But then again, you know, the, 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 the ditching of the Ross was sort of a semi-official. Right. right. It, wasn't, it wasn't individuals. I mean, okay, were there yeah, NCCs, Oh, yeah, there were people who'd be like... Rrr. Right. But more along the lines of everyone's thinking the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and my boss, well, most importantly... He's thinking the same thing. So when I do this, I'm not going to get in trouble. Right. Right. It's not just unilateral move, uh, you know, decisions made by single people. They're like, I don't like this. I want that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, the, the, it's still the military. Yeah. Right. right. All right. Next question. Quick. Your house is being sucked into a void vortex and you only have time to grab one firearm. What do you grab? Most My ex- thing is like, are you just grabbing it? One. Yeah. I was thinking the most expensive. Are you? That'd be it. It's, it's, it's actually, you right now. I'm sorry. It's the most expensive one that's currently on loan because I don't want to get in trouble with whoever owns it. Yeah, but you're in a vortex. Mm-hmm. What? What's no, that going to do you in a vortex? Well, the Lewis gun's in the house right now. Right. <laughs> so I'm taking that out because that's worth the most money in the house right now. That's true. 
That's really it, though, because there's too yeah, many things yeah. on loan. Like, I would... It's You're the other it's someone else's stuff. stuff right? yeah. no, it's like... Well, <laughs> I don't get the whole house dropping into a vortex. Like. Basically, you can only grab... It, it, they're trying to give a scenario in which... Well, imagine we have a hurricane. We get those. But the weird oh, thing sure. is that... You're only grabbing one gun, so I'm guessing you got your other, some other stuff in your other arm. I'm guessing because you, because you can carry a Lewis gun with one arm. So like, I feel like you should be able to grab multiple. Like, like only one gun, hug. the most expensive one on loan. That's what's going with me. That that's the yeah. Okay, yeah, sure, that makes sense to what me. What about you? I don't have any ones on loan. This is Baker. <laughs> it's a Baker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We've heard about the Baker. It's got to be the Baker. Yeah. Sure. Because okay. you know how long it would take him to put it back together. Put it back, make yeah, another right? one. <laughs> Screw that. All right. Um, if you had to switch to collecting a genre of military history outside of British and Commonwealth history, what would it be? Well, I already collect outside of British and Commonwealth. Well, I'm so. believing he's talking it's to be Rob. Rob. There's a bit of a single facet to that yeah, question, I yeah. guess. Eh? Um, Some people literally took this as asking direct questions more. Yeah, that's fine. Stacked around. Okay, that's direct. Yeah. I tried to spread, okay, spread them out so that Rob all the questions. it wasn't Please just God. you talking all the time, essentially. All, right. all questions should be addressed to Rob, even later when he's not here and we do another Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to be like, hey, Rob. Uh, let me think now. Um, Are you going to sit there and eat your goldfish while he's thinking? Goldfish. <laughs> Oh for, my god, the cheese for, powder. This was sponsored by Ballastol and Goldfish. <laughs> Technically, Josh sponsored the Goldfish. That's true, part. yeah. Um, for the sheer depth and breadth, American. Really? That would give access to the most interesting, you know, types um, of all. I guess maybe you also have to think about um, what you could get a hold of, too. Because it, it may also apply, like, maybe you have an easier time getting hold of American stuff versus maybe Serbian stuff or something like that. Right, yeah. I, I'd say just for closeness to what I'm familiar with, I would say, you know, American, if I think of, like, German ones or French ones or something like that. Mm-hmm. You look at the, the gamut of American. He's just picking something with a, with a language he can speak. Sure. I can research. Ooh. <laughs> That's fair. All right, um... Okay, so this one, I had to reword it because he used a weird garbled language that I don't think he was all there for, unfortunately. So I, I believe I phrased, rephrased his question uh, correctly. Oh, God, now I want to see the original. <laughs> I can read the original after this, but it was a bit garbled. Um, with British tactics of the Great War, would the Ross rifle have been changed during training or left alone? What was the original statement? Well, with did the... Uh, British tactics of the Great War would the Ross would been and change in training or left alone training or tr- left training alone well the Ross was used in training well past the adoption of the SMLE yeah mm-hmm. they used it in training we used the Ross in training so mm-hmm. did. I'm not quite right and the relation to mm-hmm. the tactics yeah they were told you not to kick it open, but I don't think they yeah. told you to kick it open anyway. You know, I actually went back because one of our um, patron supporters uh, actually commented. He was like, I think you you messed up your words here, bud. You might want to rephrase it. And so I actually went back a few days to see if he ever corrected it or, or added an addendum or something. He never did. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, I never really no, got a clear... No, it's training rifle. So, yeah. so I, I think it's kind of the... I mean... Also, the problems with the Ross weren't training related, so... No. True. Okay. Um, so now these are getting a little more uh, directed okay. uh, at Rob, actually, weirdly, okay, and okay. British muzzleloader related. Oh. There is a section in here for that, essentially. it's It shouldn't be too terribly complicated. Uh, the most complicated question I had, I put at the top, though. Mm-hmm. So you ready? Okay. Why are you so handsome? I'm merely a reflection of those around me. Wow. Who do you hang out with normally? Right. His wife? Whoever I'm with <laughs> now. Oh. You film most of your videos without us, though. It's true. Not in spirit. Oh, <laughs> look at that! Look at him milking that! Look at him going at that! Okay. He eats his wheaties. <laughs> he does. Yeah. Um, how did your interest in the Empire and Commonwealth weapons come about? I think you kind of talked the, about that in, in the Empire. Yeah. I saw Star Wars in 1977. <laughs> wow. In theater. <laughs> Um, I, th- I think you kind of talked about this in the beginning, actually, when you were originally setting up your YouTube channel. You were originally looking at cartridges and trying to figure out... Yeah, but it doesn't out say why you got video. interested in British equipment. No, I guess it doesn't say 
where your beginning actually started. Yeah. So how did your beginning first come about? But as I did, we I, robbed, I, I, I did kind of touch on that is because, especially in the early parts of our Canadian military history, mm -hmm. are very closely tied with British military history, mm -hmm. both in culture, um, equipment, f um, arms and whatnot. So mm -hmm. let's be honest, to, you like old guns study. and the British ones are the ones laying around. Well, they're also Canadian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not just British. Just <laughs> he's proud of his disability. <laughs> You're slightly out of shot with your arms. Like well, that. No. He's proud of his disability. Thank you. Now with more arm. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess I kind of answered that question. Yeah. He's Canadian. He wanted to cover the things. Were you? Do you remember your first thought where you were like, "Oh, I want to. I want to look into these this particular era of weapons or anything like that." Well, it was probably just uh, years before the channel, mm -hmm. and it was primarily interested in the black powder thing. And what motivated me was black powder. How? Do, what? What can I get that's black powder but can hit what I'm shooting at? Uh -huh. And I'm thinking to myself, and okay, the least complicated which typically I would think would be, I've never done this muzzle loading thing, but you know, it's a bullet, it's powder and you can get rifle. Yeah. That was a rifle. Wasn't it? The P-53 yeah, yeah. was a rifle. Yeah. So that should be able to, all right, maybe that's an Avenue I should go down. Mm -hmm. And I did. Okay. And, and he immediately found bullets that worked and it worked the <laughs> yeah. first time. He fell in and love. And he was yeah. very happy that it worked out well and therefore really invested in it. <laughs> oh no, you, you were discontented and became obsessive, right? Mm hmm. Wait a minute, are you telling your story or my story? Yeah, exactly. That's how it always goes. The guys that ended up being quote-unquote experts are the ones that are just like, this doesn't make any gosh darn sense. Right. It's usually how that happens. Uh, with your exploration into British and Commonwealth rifle drill and range practice, which do you think was better, World War One or World War II? Well, was was World War One in terms of drill. Okay. Yeah, I guess drill and oh. rifle practice. So I think they're trying to say drill which drill a, was more adequate for the conflict I, that came. I'm going to say, I'm gonna say, say that's drill, a better phrasing of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at drill as being training. Right. Because like drill, like marching to and fro, yeah. has nothing to do with either conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but the drills associated with the use of the rifle are essentially the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The comprehensiveness of in particular, the rifle, in terms of the training and the range work, mm -hmm. whether it gets accomplished or not in the course of, you know, in the British Army late war conscript mm -hmm. through that, their training system um, or the Canadian sort of CEF training juggernaut um, is more complicated than it is in World War II. Okay. Like the, the, the practices, the, the structure of musketry program yeah. is more complicated, more arguably more um, uh, comprehensive. Okay in the Great War mm. than it is in the Second World War. And that's just looking at the range work of the two eras, that the pre-Great War range work is modified very slightly, but has all the hallmarks of Great War musketry and snap shooting, rapid shooting, even like the the, the 15 round, 300 yard, yeah. you know, um, so-called Mad Minute. Wait, Mad Minute, <clears throat> 10 rounds. <clears throat> um, but in World War II, it's 10 rounds. And it's 40 seconds. So pace-wise, it's the same. Okay. Um, mm. But, you know, there's, I just I'm trying to remember now, is it seven or ten practices in the, the the wartime range work in World War II? Yeah. And there's 24, 25 in the universal range course in World War I. Hmm. So did, does it make the outcome any different? Um, the range work is decreased because the rifle means less on the battlefield in World War II right. than it did in World War One. Arguably only at the beginning part of World War One, Right. Um, but I guess, is that the best way to sort of answer that question in terms of which one I prefer? No, which one's best? The, well, which one's best? Which one's more comprehensive? Or which one has the most outcome on the battlefield? Right. I would think it would be the latter, personally. Right. And I would say that artillery, <coughs> tanks, and machine guns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you Always want to get it and boil it right down, that's, yep. what, that's what's important. Ultimately, by the end of that war. Mm -hmm. So... All right. Um, what are the unexpected or unrecognized difficulties and complexities of making British muzzleloaders? Ooh. Unforeseen complexities? Yeah. yeah. Maybe unrecognized or unexpected, unexpected difficulties and complexities. So things that the what viewers wouldn't necessarily even recognize. Um, 
because they get to see the polished in product mm. that you put out, the beautifully polished in product. They don't get to see all of the the trenches that you have to muck through. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I found there. out that you just wander around in the woods for days out in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Finding the perfect the, hill the perfect to lay hill. on. Oh my God, yeah. I, I would say the uh, hours of takes it takes, 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 to <laughs> formulate a presented introduction. That I can see that. For... I'm sure you're well aware. The skits. It's the skits. I have a f well, well, the skits actually go pretty quick, but it's when I'm on the fly in the bush trying to come up with like a three minute introduction right. with various scenes, you know, walk in, walk out. Yeah. And I've written it down and I'm trying to memorize it and do it and it just doesn't work. I have a follow up question for <laughs> That's that. That's why we have the teleprompter. Okay. Which one's been the most difficult? As in, which rifle were you filming with? Did it was it the most difficult Ooh, yeah. setup for what you? What episode's been the like, worst? Which one was the hardest right. one for you in terms right. of takes? Either camera wasn't working, or you just it was just not work. You weren't flowing that day, or something. Like, what mm. one was the most difficult one for you in terms of getting to that polished finished product? Mm. If you could narrow it down, right. You can only have to get the worst. You can give uh, one, human one that really sticks out to you. pretty good at forgetting trauma. <laughs> I know. You, you try to forget it so that you can continue on with what you love. It's like right. having a kid. You try to forget all the trauma with the birth. That way, you, you We've know, had so many episodes You have mom like brain. Yeah. So, so just into the toilet. So, so what one, so what <laughs> so one gave you mom movies. brain that you've yeah. forgotten about it? <laughs> you know, I can't remember any... I can remember ep certain episodes. I would say episodes. I don't mean on the channel, but, you know, instances where you've gone out and I forgot my kilt. Oh, God, yes. We've done that. Forgotten so our audio equipment. I've driven two hours to get to where I need to go, and I get to the back of the truck and open it up, and I'm like, no. Oh. Or I forgot a tripod, and I have to stop on the way and buy a brand new $300 tripod or yep. something like that. Mm. That one's mm. easy, right? Really. At, least, at least there's a store you can buy it at. Yeah. Um, most of the bigger projects entail multiple trips, multiple locations, um, and in, sometimes in different times of the year. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, yeah. there can be, there can be rain, sun, heat, snow, all in one project because I can't do it all at once. Oh and yeah. I, no. I have to make multiple trips into different spots. Uh, so like the musketry of 1914 series, there's of the range work proper. There were three videos and there were four locations used. Oh, wow. There. Four or five locations used in those three videos. And like all the 100 and 200 were shot at one spot, all the 300 was shot at one spot, all the 500 was shot at another, and the 600 was in another spot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of com complexity, it, that's a, some places I ended up traveling and coincidentally with camping trip or whatever. Right. Um, you know, many hours. It wasn't a day trip. Right. 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 Um, but, you know, there was no disasters. No. And, and in a project like that, typically, if something does go wrong, like I forget my guilt or something like that, God. you know what? I can't, I'm not getting it all done in one spot anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Can I do some like this stuff? Yeah. And talky bits or something? Can I like, save this trip and do, and do something, something productive while right? I'm here? Um, and then leave the stuff I need everything for. I'll just either come back because I have to come back anyway, or can I do it in another location where I'm going to next? Yeah. I can't think of anything that's been a wash. There's well, nothing's been a wash completely. Well, that's good. But uh, filming the talky bits at the beginning without, you know, it just, I can't, I, you know, 80 takes. Like, it's crazy. Mm. I just freaking screw my words up. And... It feels kind of good to have somebody else talk about it. I don't know why. It makes yeah. me feel, because I remember there have been days for us where it was a total wash because we literally <sighs> drove out to the range. Most of our was end up coming out with malfunctions or ammo or, or something like that. And we're just like, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't think out. of anything. Mm. I, I need a big block of wood to hit right now. Yeah. Where something's <laughs> catastrophically failed. Like in terms of machine, like the the, the firearm breaks, breaks or fire oh, pins yeah. gone, something and something. I haven't had that. He's you never can, had the Vetterly explosions. Well, <laughs> you know, I've been to the the stuff that I have is is fairly simple, right? Mm. It's there's, there's no there's no Lewis guns that have you know hundreds of parts that are working right. that that can break or or, oh, or whatever. So, um, in that sense, there's not much that can go wrong with the P fifty three. That's true, right? Still, so. To be fair, he got to experience it. The Lewis gun broke down on us when he was here. Yeah, it's true. He got to well, experience it. Well, prepared fun. by some sort of machine gun savant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> cute. All right, let's take a pause for the cameras. No. Look what the Turks left. <laughs> Oh, 
Look at that show off. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> Did you know that if you push down on the pushback, <laughs> you can let the action go under with no stress? Oh wow, that's amazing. Okay, so the next question. Would the taut musketry practices of the Martini infield in regular service have closer resemble the practices of the old world Martini or the newer Lee Metford slash infield? So this would be the three or three Martinis asking about? That's what I'm yeah. assuming, yeah. yeah. Do you know of any musketry practices for the well, Martini infield? <laughs> I'm just trying to apply what I know from like the, the Lee Metford kind of right. thing to if that <laughs> casually inserting this. No, we don't have a product for that. <laughs> She's drinking ballast. Ballast <laughs> It tastes like fennel. At least the aerosol version is, yeah. which you're not supposed to apparently have that. Have I one. shown you the ballastol uh sheet that came with the um the uh, retro flasks? No. Remind me to show you that because it's amazing. It's weirdly translated from weird German. Oh yeah, and it's. I actually think I might just start reading that as a gimmick uh, for uh, marketing. Can you read it. German? No, it's in English, but it's like <laughs> it's. I'll start reading it to you guys as part of the Ballastall promo segment. That'll be pretty funny, actually. Anyway, I'm sorry. But we're talking about Martini Enfield. <laughs> Martini Enfield. Um, I guess I can't say I can't comment specifically about it. Uh, whether there were specific, say, Indian Army, you know, practices right. in their musketry program, they're the ones that really it would see the most use with. So, really, is that where they mostly went? Well, because they're they're not a frontline weapon in British service, right? Um, so, like, quote unquote, colonial service is where they kind of manifested themselves, right? Um, and the Indian Army did use them. So, uh, after the Boer War, that whole two power standard kind of thing that the British observed with keeping the Indian Army one step behind, yeah, generally gets done away with. Okay, moving forward towards the Great War, okay, and the Indian Army is armed with the same rifles that, uh, as they're able to equip them, okay, as the British Army. So, uh, it it's not something that I can give a complete total answer on, but because okay. uh, it would have been a regional drill anyway, it wouldn't be. Generally speaking, whatever they do, whatever they were doing with them was not coming from the top in Britain as standard training. No, but it would have been, I mean, completely sanctioned within the British Indian Army. Oh, okay. Right? But was it, were the practices like of the old world martini or of the newer league? That's what he's saying is he oh. yeah, is I don't quite, oh. I quite, quite know. Did they just maintain the sort of the musketry standards and programs that were in existence, say, before yeah. the Boer War? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it stands to reason they would. Uh, but I can't say for sure because I've never actually sure. looked at any kind of musketry from the specifically Indian Army. So. Right. I gotcha. Now you oh. have homework. I do. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next question. Will you ever find a venue to talk about the Cold War Commonwealth soldier? Who? I guess um, Rob? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, this was directed at Rob. Actually, specifically, these I put in this section, they said specifically for Rob. I, mean, I feel like I saw exactly you in a Cold War thing. outfit recently. Shh. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that won't happen. Go he on. said even without the guns, since this no, first character it's definitely, understands. No, there's definitely not. <laughs> Rob definitely didn't have a specific gun and a specific outfit. The Move on, next question. <laughs> he understands correctly fouls are illegal in Canada. Anyway. Yeah. Right. Oh, man, if only he could go somewhere where they weren't. Where they weren't. <laughs> and um, hang out. And have appropriate kit for it. Mm. Oh. Um, hmm. mm. Anyway. How would that happen? I don't know. Magic. <laughs> um, post World War One, with Canada gaining its identity, how did Canada's training and arms usage diverge from Britain? I think I ate too much meat tonight. It's starting to come back. <laughs> I'm, good now. I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> I meant, I meant, um, it went, sorry, we what, ate. What, what we did ate you, okay, so they what, what did you mean? So the, this user said that they ate too much meat tonight. No, nope, I just suddenly had to burp and I was afraid it was going to be something else, but I'm okay now. <laughs> this is. The, <laughs> They can't see me. Have we turned a corner? They here? can't. They, well, the last, viewers can't what the see audience me. doesn't know is after the last camera break, we went out to dinner, <laughs> over ate, and came back, and now apparently we're gotten a lot done. I'm good. I have a ripple. So this will be my third one today. I'll the ripple right. might be why you're feeling. No, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm there. I'm sorry. The question. Uh, yes. Do you need me to read it again? Yes. Okay. We're completely. Post World War One, with Canada gaining its identity, how did Canada's training and arms uses diverge from Britain? Um, the short answer is they didn't that the manuals and texts and everything that were used by the British Army 
mm-hmm. were promulgated throughout the empire, and Canada used those very same things. Oh. Okay, so they were... Yeah, they didn't. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no. They just did the different flag thing. Oh, right, yeah. Wait, when did you guys get the maple leaf? What year? 64. Oh, Jesus. Wow. 64? Yeah, I think it was 64. Okay. It's in the 60s. Anyway. Do you miss the red ensign? It has a certain charm. <laughs> <laughs> So especially when you see sort of any kind of um, uh, a, like gaming kind of context where, you know, strategic games oh, or whatnot. Right. And oh, right. it's like oh, the Canadians landed, or even on television in a documentary where the Canadians landed at Juno Beach and there's a maple leaf Maple leaf and you're and like, like yeah. oh, okay, I, can, I can understand mm. why they did that. But oftentimes is it because they just don't know? Or is it because they're trying to use something that is more readily identifiable as Canadian in the current context? They're hoping you think the second one. Oh, probably, they're hoping, probably. yeah. Probably. Yeah. yeah, there are a few, however, that are out there. Um, and the older the documentary is, the more chances they use the period correct flag. Right. Um, a, you do see it used. The ensign that is used in those kinds of contexts. Right. But certainly, a lot of modern stuff and any kind of like war gaming, a computer game, or whatever strategic stuff. Oftentimes, you know, you see the maple leaf, and you're kind of like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's it's good you're making sure that you're recognizing. You're like we had however, leaves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and sometimes they did turn red. <laughs> there are some proto made maple leaf patterns, aren't there? Well, there like, was a, it, was like it, was good... a, it was a huge national competition, yeah. and there was all kinds of designs submitted. No, no, but I mean the maple leaf had some. Um, it was in the ensign, wasn't it? Yeah, it had maple three leaf. at the bottom. Yeah. Of the, well, there's a number but, of ensigns, right? And they there's a number of different patterns. The one that we would typically associate with, say, the Second World War and the right. year, that is the sort of final pattern. Right. And it had three maple leaves in gold across the bottom, right. and below the shield. And I've seen the maple leaf represented in other sort of derivative things that are representations of Canada specifically. Often but usually a, it's the three there, clusters. There's, there's a three a cluster of three leaves. Right. Yeah. And that was actually used for one of the the finalists for uh, the flag, right. which was that red cluster of three leaves right. and then on the sides were blue. Oh. Yeah. And the blue has never been officially sort of part of Canadian colors as it were. Right. But it was that symbol was there's Canada in the middle flanked by two oceans. Okay. Was sort oh. of the, the way it was. Okay, but sure, in the okay. end they're like blue is in their color. <laughs> and and then you can see like, 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 we got oceans, <laughs> we got trees and ocean. So what Canada, more do you want? Is Canada now surrounded by Fire? Or blood. <laughs> or blood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the most distinctive flags out there. Anyway. Yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, next question. Well, you give it credit for not just being another tricolor. Oh, sure. yeah. That's true. A lot of people do the tri. Us, the Poles, and Peru. Good to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, with the way it seems Canadian gun laws are going, would it be worth moving to the United States? Are you asking if Rob wants to move to the United yeah, they're States, literally or are you asking, asking if... No, they're specifically... At, well, maybe. Maybe they're Canadian and they want to move to the United maybe. States. Maybe. Maybe they're wondering if it's worth it as a collector. Um, that's two ways of looking at it. As long as you yeah. don't move to the South, we're full. <laughs> they're so full. Oh, my God. I wouldn't let my own grandmother move into this city right now. There's so many people here. I never met your grandmother, so I don't know. I never did either. She was dead before. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> well, that worked then. I'm just saying, like, it is so full. This this city. Go to the next city over. They're, they're not as full. So but you're saying yes, but no. Rob can attest. We tried to go, we'd just drive down the road. Oh, Okay, my that God. was weird, right? Yeah, I agree. It was weird. So we were trying to come home from the range, and the the there's this bridge called the Mark Clark, mm-hmm. which makes me laugh because South Park. Um, I just think general music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's more reasonable with just calling everything Mark Clark, yeah. you know? And then, anyway, so... <laughs> There were three accidents on the Mark Clark Bridge, and when we pulled by every single time, they weren't accidents. They're just people pulled over in fairly new-looking cars that didn't look like they were broken down. No, they'd just be they pulled over with their hazard. hazard. Well, someone had its hazard. Oh yeah, on, but one the did, two, but the other most did didn't. Not. And they were just the people in them were just like sitting in their cars, just staring into the middle distance. And I'm going, what horror movie am I you about think to they be just a part gave of? Up. <laughs> they just saw that and just went no and just pulled over and gave yeah, up. Yeah, and then we tried to transition where. 526 and 26 meet, which is now an outlet area, and there's a coliseum there and everything. And some sort of band was playing that we didn't know anything about. I've never heard of them. Still Everybody haven't. says they're really big. I don't what, Do you remember the name? Pen, pentatonics or something? I don't know. Pen something or other? Yeah. Um, there's five of them. We're going to get yelled at because apparently they're like hot <laughs> shit, and I've never even heard of this. Nope. So, like, the entire area was gridlocked, and we're just like, 
And we, we everywhere. Just, was yeah, we're like, we just want to get food and not be. <laughs> it's been better going to the fairgrounds than it has been going to that. And I thought that fairgrounds, going to that was bad. Yeah, our county, not, not the fairgrounds, but like the county fair. Yeah, the county fair. Our yeah. county fair is like that. Like, yeah. that's the one event. I don't. I don't know why. I remember but going the, the one county event fair. that goes to that complete shit is the county fair. <laughs> so it was bad. What were we saying? Um, was oh, it, should you move to the United States? I don't yeah, know because of Canadian to. gun laws. Yeah, maybe. It, uh, I guess you know what in a in a kind of fantasy world that that would be the only mitigating factor, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, because you know you wouldn't have any family, you wouldn't have any connections. Well, there's, you all, have any there's all kinds work. of other things mm-hmm. other than just that. Um, it's uh, our our current situation is. Uh, Perhaps in the in that in our in our shooting community, um, the best way to illustrate that would be sort of like a nuclear explosion yeah. going going up right now. So it's, wow. it's sad days. Yeah. You guys should get like you should get really mad, and then you should honk about it, <laughs> and then go home, and nothing will change. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's a deep, dark hole yeah, that we're right? yeah. down towards. <laughs> what, a, what a very sweet way of doing things yeah. that did not seem to make any difference to anybody. To be fair, we've done it in the U.S. Yeah, we had true. a big Virginia gun ban thing coming up, and they had this massive rally, and no problems. Every cleanup after this house wonderful. And then they went home, and then they went, okay, we're still doing it anyway. Because, you know, mm-hmm. like... Turns out they'll all just behave. So I guess we could just do this because they're going to behave. Anymore. Actually, this next question kind of leads on to that Canada gun laws bit now. Um, how will the new firearms restrictions affect your channel potentially? Oh, yeah. Are you affected? There are some. They cut potentials. off his love of handguns. Do you understand how many handgun videos he had planned? So oh, my many. God. Rob loves handguns so much. Which comes from my natural ability using them, of course. You say that, but I have uh, video evidence that you are extremely <laughs> competent. Uh, let's go. Let's go. Uh, to, I mean, let's go I'm going to I'm, I'm I'm demand great. that we play that B-roll right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. That is a 31 pocket at what I believe is 90 yards. <laughs> oh my god. So, okay, now they've seen it. <laughs> yeah. That was a, yeah. I mean, I think I, I think I mumbled it on the thing in my, by the way, my head cold where I'm like, <laughs> um, like I, I was like, I was like, <laughs> But he has like a 90, 95 yard shot with a 31 caliber Colt pocket pistol. I'm like, Rob, you want to try this? I got one chamber loaded. Yeah. He's like, okay. Bing. Bing. And it's just like, well. All I got to say is that dogs and fire hydrants. <laughs> Blind dogs in particular. <sighs> so with handguns, yes, but not really much. Yeah, so they ruined well, all of his handgun they're, plans. They're, I mean, I. Also, he was totally going to film with the foul that they're not allowed to have. Yeah. That that has been long standing. Yeah. There's all bunch of things that are uh, sadly you, sort of not to say not to say in the works, but there are. Has any of your things, col- has any of your collection moved into the list? Uh, not yet. Oh, so oh. there are some things that may, does that mean you get to go? Not my problem. Pending. Not my problem. No, no, I dis- disagree with that way of, yeah. of of thinking for sure. Because just yeah, because one of one part of the yeah, I ate a bunch of meat. <laughs> I'm just not, like y'all just say he went from just being normal, like easy keel to just I'm a thighs. Look at me, I can be a wiggle yeah. puppy in my chair. They expect <laughs> us to go crazy in the third quarter. Of these. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like this is normally when it's. We usually didn't finish these, by the way. This is the earliest this has been for getting towards the end of like this. Usually it's like four in the morning. Yeah, usually like, it's late. Very very, very <laughs> late. So this is quite new to us. So good job, both of you. Anyway. Do you ever watch Runkel? Do you know that Runkel guy? I know who he is and yeah. from time to time. Yeah, you should yeah. watch him. Oh, yeah. He's nice. Of the Bailey. He's very white. Like Hair. Yeah, just uh, everything. Like, I, we, we're friends with Matt LaRose here, mm-hmm. who's very brown. I said they should just hang out. <laughs> like, <laughs> as, a, as a contrast? Yeah. Just okay. like, imagine, like, you remember the old cameras, how bad they were at color balancing, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. different people? Mm-hmm. That'd be awesomely bad. Like, Matt would enjoy that. Yeah. Really I would. love that. All right. Um, next question. What is your favorite British uh, piece of kit? Not necessarily the best, but your personal favorite. Piece of kit. Yeah. Mm. 
1908 webbing. Specifically British piece of Yeah, he loves the 1908 webbing. Yeah, we did talk about that. Yeah, it's his favorite, except for that little canteen thing on the back that flops around and makes him mad. Yes. But you also do think it's the best, but it is just generally your favorite. Oh, yeah. Is it your favorite? Why is there something else? I think that... Is it something Graham made you? Has Graham made me something from that? Not quite yet. Um, Wait, I'll, he hasn't I'll, made you anything? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what do you make you? He's made me a couple pouches. Are they not your favorite? Oh, I'm sorry, Graham. Listen, listen. If you're watching you know this, you know what? <laughs> Hi, I'm <laughs> Matthias. This is my pot. I'm stirring it. That is kind of how he starts. Yeah, I like Graham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Graham's made a couple of very high quality pieces. This is Graham the leather guy. Yeah, I think right. that's what he Googles as, right? Graham the leather guy? Graham the leather guy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he boy. broke his arm. But now he's better. Um, my, I, I have a kind of an interesting soft spot for the, the 71 pattern equipment. It's the marks the transition between uh, sort of the old style pouch belt, you know, cross your uh, cross belt. Yeah, with, cross with, your heart. Big, <laughs> uh, on, uh, with a you know big, large 50 round kind of ammunition yep. pouch. And then this transition between or into something that's beginning to be modern. Right. In terms of a belt with pouches. I think they thought it was modern when they did it. Well, it was at the time it was completely modern. Yeah. Um, it's not perfect and it's well, it's quite imperfect actually when yeah. you look at the greater sort of selection of equipment. Uh, it, it's the set of equipment that is associated with sort of the that late middle Victorian era, the 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 Zulu war kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. high points like that. Um Wait, it, they carried high points in the yeah. Zulu Wars? Very high. The bane is super long. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> um, so as a system, uh, for what it is, it's interesting to me anyway, because it marks that kind of breakaway from that old-fashioned style of equipment that had been used for like 150 years beforehand mm-hmm. to the start of what ends up being like the 1908 set. Right. And on into the 37 pattern. And all okay. That stuff. So I'm not going to lie, I Googled Graham the leather guy. Is I- that the other Graham the leather I don't know. I, I've, you know, I came Does up he have with two different a guy named Keith instead of the leather guy. Wait, you googled Graham the leather guy and you got you Keith, Keith the leather yeah. guy? Yeah. Graham, no we gotta work on your SEO. No kidding. Well, it's it's the leather guy, and so I went to the leather guy. You know, the website. No, we went Graham the leather guy. Yeah, I know, but I went the the first thing that comes up is the leather guy, which is a website dot org, the leather guy dot org. And that's not Graham. That's Keith and his wife who started the leather guy no, business. No. So I think I don't know if you know if. He's got an actual website, but certainly a Facebook page. It is a Facebook page. Yeah. No, it's a Facebook page, but it's for the Keith and I need to and get him. Wife to, I keep forgetting couple. I gotta send him something. I'll just send it with you and you can take it to him. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll get that across the border, won't I? <laughs> I mean you would. It'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's take a pause with the cameras. Least comfortable kit versus most comfortable kit. The Go. 1908 pattern web equipment. <laughs> it's definitely the most comfortable. What's okay. the least comfortable? Yeah. Yeah, least comfortable. Um, probably a toss up between the fully loaded Napoleonic kit, which is a 60 round brown vest pouch on one belt. Oh. Like it is a chunk on your hip. Yeah. In the That's like a sense. cartridge bag, like straight up going shotgun it, it, shooting. It's 60, 69 caliber round balls, Jeez. plus the powder, plus the pouch itself. It's like a brick. It's about this brick. Speaking of Graham, the letter. Yeah, over it, one shoulder. Over one shoulder. And it just, it wants to, uh, although tradition or historically there was actually a strap that uh, was tied off between the pouch and the bayonet. They yeah. sort of keep things pulled back on the top of your ass. But um, without that, all it wants to do is rotate around your body and bang on your hip. So well, that's an interesting pull statement right there. Just take that one statement from this whole thing yeah. <laughs> out of context. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. I can make sound bites so too. So did Graham make you one? Is that what you're saying? He made me one, yeah. So you, you, it's I, not your favorite though? No. Okay. As quality, absolutely. As functionality, no. <laughs> you should See, make it so better. So he brought that back. You make it better. Yeah. Put some padding on it. I really, really hope he watches this. I don't know if he would. I don't know. I'll tell him to. No, don't tell him to. Oh, okay. I want him to be surprised. Like, I want to get the weird. 
Tom, uh, we did the Enfield revolvers, and I mentioned I know one that's still in service. <laughs> and like, Tom, Tom, did you see that episode? No. Okay, so you met the Mark, the Mark one Rob's two. met Tom, the yes, infamous Tom. Yes. Um, and he, Rob will back me up. He will open carry black powder revolvers. He didn't open <laughs> carry his Enfield because I had them. I borrowed them for the episode. That was the irony of that episode. Right. I'm waving around his gun, being like, "Yeah, he open carries one of these." Was oh wait, it, he open carries this one. Was was he? Was it a Webley or was it an Adams he was carrying around? I think he was carrying an Adams. An Adams. We, took his, Adams. <laughs> we took his Enfield, so he had to go back to the Adams. You know, we had to go step, wait, take a step back. Don't we also have one of his Adams with us? Oh, maybe. Oh, okay. If we have his Adams, we do. So then, which one was he carrying? He could have been calling. He also has been known to carry a Colt seventy eight. It's like he picks yeah. the worst revolver. And, and Tom, of course, was the orchestrator of the mustache tattooing incident because he was the one that set me. Uh, up. Yeah, he gave you the, the VR. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, <laughs> Robin VR is one of my favorite things. <laughs> so I just like the creepy finger coming and going. Rrr. So the uh, what the hell are we talking God, about? God, I hope we saw that oh, footage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what Anything but answering questions. That's for sure. Yeah, I forgot it. What was that? It's even? a good thing I saved all the, what, the fun questions. What are we on? I completely end. lost the train of thought. Oh, shoot. I forgot. Oh, least comfortable kit versus most right. comfortable kit. Yeah, but how kit. did we start talking about Tom? Or you're talking about kits and gear with people. No, then we're talking about the, the bag, and then we talked the about bag. Graham. What just happened? I was going somewhere with this, and, and we were messed it up. Were you talking about the custom Kydex holster you got? No. Is that what no. you're going to go to? No. We, you said you had something for Graham to make. And you were going to send it home? No, 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 no. Yeah, but that's totally different. Yeah, okay. What? Where I don't I know where you this? going. We have to play this, this back on. I don't. I really... Tom VR. No, we weren't. You brought up VR. Right, but Tom was the. Oh, yeah. How did you mention Tom in the first place? Yeah. How did that come up? Because we're talking. You were talking about. Were talking about uh, this is going to sound really funny because we just talked about it, carry. and everyone watching is going to be going. You just said that. Yeah, but we won't remember. Why can't you Guys, remember that? It's not even. It's. I promise. I it's ten twenty-four p.m. There was some contextual reason, but then we got so lost at the debate. How about this? You go oh, back. Oh, to Graham! I got it. I found okay. it. Don't tell Graham. Yes. Because he needs to be surprised. With us. I didn't tell Tom. That's right. one. Oh, okay. Got so it. Tom's driving in his car and he has it on so he can listen to it, right? Because it's not a lot of people listen. Yeah. So Tom's listening and he hears there's at least one still in service. And he goes, Oh my god, there's one still in service. I wonder where that is. My buddy Tom. And he goes, <laughs> he's in his car. He's kind of lured. He's like, he's like, you suckered me so perfectly because I'm like, wait, there's one still in service? Damn it. <laughs> And it's just oh. like, well, I feel called out. <laughs> <laughs> Too good. Um, so next question is, what's your favorite uniform? Oh, it's got to be the mm. 70th Highlander from the 1860s. That's not true. I've been his wife. <laughs> He's, she told me he has this little UPS uniform. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. That he has on the side. Okay. Yeah. He doesn't even work for UPS. I, I he just has the uniform. I have no idea. But I didn't deliver a package. I didn't ask for one. I know. Yeah, she found it in his car, and he was just like, oh, yeah, I got that for a role play. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has turned a corner here, hasn't it's it? It's good. <sighs> oh, it's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> um, what do you wear under your kilt? Uh, David knows the answer to that. He does. David knows the answer to this. <laughs> there's, there's a really crass comment, which goes something along the line. I never use it myself. But it, it goes along oh, the lines. Oh, you never use it. No, it goes along the lines of something like uh, shoes and socks and lipstick if I'm lucky. Oh, David would love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rob had to take some prone positions on the range, and David just happened to be in the wrong position. <laughs> <laughs> All he did look straight in the eye and say, We are now the best of friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, apparently, you were there? that is a way till David's heart. Apparently, yeah, right there. <laughs> it's like you, you had already met your wife before, but you saw her again. It was just like I know something that you, you know. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, uh, what is the most useless piece of uniform gear that you have discovered in your research into British uniforms? So the most useless piece. I, and we're talking about equipment here. Yeah, yeah. serve no yeah, function. I guess. No function. Yeah. What doesn't <sighs> serve a function, though? It all pretty much does. It has it's, to. Well, it's military equipment. It, right. Everything's there for a reason. Um, Maybe something that... Like, uniform-wise, obviously, is an easy, that's a way easier question, but that's not equipment. Maybe there's one that you could apply it to where it's like, it was at one point useful as part of the uniform, but it stayed with the uniform even after it yeah. lost its usability. See, again, you're talking clothing versus equipment, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the feather bonnet is... <laughs> as magnificent as it is, uh, is 
It's not like you had a complete. You guys didn't have like leather piece. helmets or anything like the Germans did. Um, well, we had uh, like home service helmets in the Canadian militia of the 1870s and 80s. And that's the same same helmet the British had. Hmm. Right? Um, and then we transitioned into what we called the universal pattern, which was essentially a foreign service helmet, like the white one. Right. Um, and that became the sort of default Canadian full dress headgear. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Um, up until the transition into the Wolseley helmet uh, after the uh, World War. And then that, to, even to this day, uh, Canada still maintains a tradition, although not sort of issued generally, but a tradition of full dress, like red tunics and that kind of stuff. And for Canadian line infantry, mm -hmm. uh, being your sort of bog standard, non-guards, non-highland, all that kind of stuff, the white helmet, the white Wolseley helmet, mm -hmm. is still the default Canadian full dress headdress mm. with a, a puggery around it of varying colors and a badge on the front. Oh, wow. So much like the Royal Marines, if you're familiar with the Royal Mar band of the Royal Marines. Yeah, but none of this sounds that useless. No. No, no. I mean, that's a sun helmet. Yeah. Right? But that's a clothing and equipment. Or clothing, rather. So... But equipment, I'm, I mean, I'm going through the sets, the sort of the pouch belt stuff. Everything's there. It may not be completely functional mm -hmm. in terms of what we would expect to see today. But it's, I mean, you have to carry your ammunition somehow. It's inefficient, right. but not necessarily non-functional. Yes, right. 100%. Okay, I yeah. get that. That's um, fair. All the belts, I mean, just a belt around your waist supporting mm -hmm. bayonet or pouches. And, um, what about hmm. even just decorative stuff like... Um, what do they call it with the Highlanders? Don't they have like a type of sporn? A hair sporn? Yeah. Yeah, so that's... Does just, that serve a function, the hair? There is a pouch in it, in behind. No, 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 but the hair... No, it's just decorative. That's what I'm saying. Maybe, yeah. like, yeah, that's not... No, I guess I could see sporn. that, a decorative thing yeah. that's not really doing much. Yeah. I mean, then those were worn. Uh, the first instance you see them not being used in the field is the Boer War. Yeah. Um, but even, even then, they're still part of your kit. Right. Uh, actively campaigning on the veldt. Commonly, the kilts were covered in a khaki apron. Right. Uh, but you, there's pictures of the later part of the war where the sort of the blockhouse routine became predominant. Right. And troops that were posted to the blockhouse lines, very much a static small group of, of soldiers at yeah. given locations, there's photographic evidence that hairsporns were still, obviously they were issued, right. but still used and worn. Right, being worn. Because they're in more of a static, you know, non campaigning type of operation. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're there in this exactly the same way that they've been worn beforehand. So were hairsporns used during the Boer War? Yes. But predominantly sort of an active campaigning, they weren't. Right. And uh, but hairsporns come right back sort of into peacetime soldiering right the way through uh, until the Great War. Hmm. Okay. So you see uh, you know British troops or Highland troops on exercise uh, both in Canada and uh in, in Great Britain, right. uh, on exercise, essentially, on maneuvers and whatnot, wearing hairsporns with their service dress. Okay. So it's kind of a, a weird juxtaposition of a functional, modern kind of garment in terms right. of its color, it, you know, and uh, it's cut. But then you've got this massive hairy, you know, ball, hairy sack. ball sack hanging between your legs. Yeah. All right. That's a good descriptive term. It's the ultimate man purse. Yes, it is. Um... What's the most expensive uniform mm. that you own? And I would argue you could even call expensive. Have you seen the rates on that Graham the Leather guy? <laughs> oh, my God. I would not only argue that you could say expensive in terms of monetarily, but right. also time-consuming if something like oh, expensive true, like costs you a lot of time to yeah, make right. or acquire um, the pieces for it. So I would argue one or the other there's, words. There's two ways that you could look at it. Is one, that actually, the actual cost to me. Because sometimes the you know pieces are I I found and sourced that were cheaper, mm -hmm. but maybe the quality wasn't as good. Right, mm -hmm. and you know if I or you got lucky, or I found uh, and decided to go a different avenue with a later purchase on a different piece of clothing, that historically would have been cheaper, but my cost was higher because I went for something more high quality. Sure. All overall, the Highland uniforms, if you were to look at what they actually cost, sort of in period. And compared, oh, yeah, with all the and wool. compared to him, well, just the kilt, the feather bonnet, uh, all the extra bits and pieces that go with a Highland uniform. Oh, yeah. Um, or more expensive than putting yourself in a jacket and a pair of pants and a and a, a slightly fancy hat. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just inherent in the uniform. Sure. So as far as, it, that's sort of two ways to look at it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good point. Um, what other ways do you enjoy yourself on that amazing property? I'll, uh, I'm assuming he doesn't really know you got to multiple different 
areas right. to yeah. film. So what's what's so, some, some ways so, you enjoy yourself out there? Uh, Rob it, wanders it, onto other people's property and just hopes <laughs> they don't notice while he's there. That's not the case. <laughs> um, so the the areas in which I use are belong to everybody. It's known in Canada as Crown Land, and the activities that I do are perfectly acceptable, given safe. Boy, that sentence doesn't come out very strong, does it? No, it somehow, when you say it, it kind of no, sounds. Well, the activities that I do are perfectly acceptable. But what it's I not when you what, say it, what so I wanted worse. to I didn't want to say was like make sure that they're legal, and of course they're legal. Um, Crown land is land held by the government mm -hmm. and is open use uh, for, among other things, hunting. Um, logging companies have licenses to cut the trees down and, and replant them. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of different uses for Crown land. Okay. Um, cattlemen have their cattle out free range in, yeah. on Crown land as well. Did it shoot between the cattle? You, you avoid that at all costs, <laughs> cattle period. Okay. The last thing you want to do is upset a cattleman okay. with his cattle. Have you come across a lot of people while being out there? That's not part of the question, but no. I'm just generally curious. Um, do you ever just like wander up on some stranger and you're in your little outfit? It's, it's like, like hello. <laughs> My what? Little outfit. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 there have been some times and um, some of the looks get rather interesting. <laughs> Rob got to see me make David. <laughs> <laughs> David's a police officer, and uh, I, um, every once in a while I'll run into him, like, on the job or whatever. Have tr back in the day, we'd have trainees a lot, you know? So I'd catch him, you know, in his town where he works, and I'd just be, I, I'd just be like, oh, that's cute, you guys got your little matching outfits? And, like, <laughs> it always annoyed the crap out of them. <laughs> the, like, uniform, and I'm just like, yeah, little matching outfits. You guys got together, got the same outfit. Don't you look so cute. cute. Don't you look cute. You're on the same team with your little outfit. <laughs> it just makes them so mad. <laughs> Um, if you ever see two cops together, just be like, oh, you guys got matching outfits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll love that. That's how you make friends, yeah. <laughs> um, Rob, what is the... Uh, wait, no, we didn't get the answer. What happens when you run into strangers out there, uh, like, carrying around a oh, rifle wait, dressed yeah, like yeah, a lunatic? Yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes... Uh, there's a man in a dress with a rifle oh in the middle God. of the woods. Uh, reactions range from, hey, what are you doing? Can you imagine you're out for a hike and, and you've then, never heard of British muggle and, owners? And then the react once I explained to them, they're like, Oh, that's pretty cool. What do you, and then actually engaging in some sort of conversation. Right. I've had that happen, which is mm, out of the ordinary. To wait, really? Yeah. Wait, to, to actually what? engage in conversation about what I'm doing. Really? Yeah. They normally don't engage in no, conversation. No, or or they just it's completely. They're like, I don't know what I'm looking at right now. I'm gonna but, tell you, cult, but I need to run away culturally <laughs> here. You could never. It'd be a minimum twenty minutes. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that that would be like the fastest conversation yeah. would be twenty oh, yeah. minutes because yeah. you'll usually lose an entire hour. Basically, <laughs> but see, we, to just we've chatting. had this conversation too, and I think we we did it on the podcast when we did it for mm -hmm. the patrons. There's a patron podcast with me and Rob shooting the shit too. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's like a weird cultural thing where the South just anything that's strange. It requires conversation. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's like, and who are you? And where are you from? And right. what's that about? And, you know, just like, and it's just dig, 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 dig. Even dig. if I they mean, don't know much about whatever you're doing, they, so, they want to know. Southerners will ask you deeply personal <laughs> questions very quickly. Oh, yeah. And they'll tell you deeply personal answers. Like, you want somebody's medical history? Just sit on a bus stop for like 10 minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. But, or though, like you saw, go to a restaurant. Right. Yeah. So anytime I'm transporting, yeah, you know, I've I've been transporting machine guns and gotten pulled over. You know what I mean? And they, and it's just like, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's a light machine gun from World War One. Is that live? Well, yeah, but it's not loaded right now. That's awesome. Like the, the, <laughs> the, the cops aren't even like worried about whether it's yeah. legal or not. They're too busy to be like, when was that used? Who used it? You know, like just mm -hmm. dig, 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 dig. Never a thought to be like. Wait, are you in trouble? Like, nothing. They're yeah. just, like, just happy that somebody's talking to them about yeah, yeah. cool stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah. I still like that one night that I got pulled over. Um, oh, my God. And the, I had a bumper sticker on the back of my car back in yeah, the day. Then. And uh, the cop, while, you know, he wanders up to the car and she, he's shining his light she, in. She had a bumper sticker. Yeah. It was, like, just a little thing or whatever. It's, like, girls love guns, mm -hmm. you know? That's all it was. Yeah. And I guess he saw that as he was getting ready to pull her over for a taillight thing, you know? So, yeah. yeah. and he wanders up and he goes... All right. Shine the flashlight. Which one of you likes guns? And we all slowly raise our hands, yeah. and like two of us in use and go, we do? So like, he's like, he got the flashlight here, he's blowing it in your eyes, and you're like, oh my God, and he's just like, now who here loves guns? Yeah. And like every, like there's three of us in the car, we're all like, we like we're raising our hands. Well, I say it questioningly. Goes, so like, everybody raises their hands like all of us, and he's just like, hot damn, what you got? And my head is just like, what are you carrying? What are you, what are you, how many rounds is that? Yeah. And he, 
Oh, by the way, your taillight's out. You should get that checked out. <laughs> Bye, have a good one. Like, she's yeah, wanted to talk about... He, wanted, he wanted a 15-minute no, conversation about guns. He started, he started walking away, and he wasn't even going to say anything at first. And he went, oh, by the way, your taillight's out. Just get that fixed. Bye. <laughs> like, he almost forgot to even tell me about it. And I was like, oh, hey, thanks, Bo. I didn't even know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a sell for you. I love it. Oh, let's take a pause for the cameras real quick. Oh, no, wait. You didn't get the other... Wait, do we have time? Yeah, we have time. Okay. We have like two minutes. What's the... um? What's the other take? Because you said the ones that will engage with you, but what's the other take? Is oh, yeah. the complete opposite. Well, like that if I've, had, if I've had been doing something and you can hear like a quad or something coming up the coming up the road behind me, and you're like, okay, you sort of turn around, and I, I always make a point of like engaging with whoever comes up yeah. the road or, or whatever. So you just do your wave, and, yeah, and be like hi, and you know you get whatever. <laughs> <all over. laughs> and and uh, these they stop the one there was two end up being two of them, and they stop like out of earshot like I couldn't yell out they had their helmet on and, and the yeah. quads are running so but they came over like Bruh! and I'm sort of standing there with this rifle in my crook of my hand or something and I'm like hi how are you nothing and not, not even like yeah, that's like there's nothing going on yeah and I'm like kind of looking and then the second one pulls up I'm like oh there's two of them okay and I'm like are you guys like, typically like stop your quad throw, yeah. throw your leg over come walking up and say, what's going on? Yeah, what are yeah. you doing? Like have some sort of thing, but nothing. And like dead straight, not moving. Now, whether they were talking in the, if, yeah, they, if they had a headset or, or comms, yeah. I don't know, but it didn't look like usually when they talk to you, when, some, when you talk to somebody, yeah, you usually it, kind of turns, and there's some sort of body language to indicate nothing, just dead still looking straight at me. The second one came up, same thing. And it was this uncomfortable like minute. As they're sitting there idling and I'm like, just get off your quad and come and say hello. Like, I'm busy here. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like come or go do something. Right. right. And uh, then you, like was, slowly and then, behind and then, a tree or something. And then like, it was literally like one of them went like this, did this. And it was like, <laughs> and they just, just, they just, they just left. Just pieced out. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Uh, so <laughs> that's sort of one. I've never had anybody hostile. Right. Um, most people are just completely mystified about what it is. Or yeah. They're looking at you blinking like, uh, Hi. That'd be the best surprise in the woods. Mm -hmm. I'd be so happy. You would be so happy. <laughs> um, I was in one particular video I was filming. Oh, we're about, uh, to we're gonna, about to lose it. Let me take a pause for the camera real quick. Jammed. <laughs> We're geared for uh, the, this camera style because it works for everything we do. Mm -hmm. 20 minute cycle. And it doesn't matter anywhere in the show until we do something like this where it's just an extended one thing. And then everybody's like, why are you all yeah, different? And I'm just like, because it works for literally everything except for this one thing that we rarely do. So we're just going to ride with this. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Oh. Uh, what were you about to say though? Yeah. Oh, it's sort of another one experience of uh, somebody had come up. I'm um, standing there in some ridiculous, you know, brightly colored uniform that I was using for a project. And his first words were to me, it was like, are you hunting? <laughs> i like, and, and, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> like, like, no, try it old I, school style today. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, I'm not. You're like, yeah, Zulus. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen any? <laughs> Oh my god! If I could figure out where you were, do you know how? Do you know how much money I would try to spend to get one person to follow you out there? And the minute you're all dressed up and set up, have them march in in the opposing <laughs> army's uniform and just have them be like, "Ooh, this is awkward." And have you be like, "Who the hell's out here?" Like, it's French muzzle loaders. <laughs> what are you doing here? Oh, that'd be great. Oh, uh, speaking of filming, Rob, uh, what video is the one that you are the most proud of? Oh, boy. Uh oh I know. He's got to pick his favorite just, out of all of his I children. I, no, I, I is it going to be one of the baker, or is he going to check something different <laughs> and break the baker's heart? <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Oh, um, I guess there's different ways to look at that. It's only his videos, right? You can't be proud of my videos. Right, yeah, yeah only well, his. I, apparently that was the question. Um, I prefer to let other people comment on how good my videos are. Oh, whoa! Or, or not? <laughs> you don't have one that you felt like when you were done. You're like, oh my no, god! Well, this 1914 musketry series is, as far as the completeness, because it's sort of a package, right, from beginning to end, and that's sort of the one 
looking back that I had the most kind of, what's the word? Not necessarily fun, but of course it was all fun. Sense of accomplishment? That's perhaps a good yeah. way to say it. Because I it was, I get it. It was a package that started with an introduction to what musketry was and then some preliminary training and then the, all the shooting and a little bit about prizes and awards. And then we got, got to sort of go down a bit of a rabbit hole with the Mad Minute and put everything in the right context. Right. Um, Mike helped me out for that. Yeah, that, you have that 10 one. rounds. <laughs> I really get that. Uh, it was like with us with our Project Lightning. It, I don't think it was our best filming and or performance because we had very little sleep for several days oh there in a row God. during trying to do that. It's but only because I put a deadline The sense of it. accomplishment when we finished editing everything mm -hmm. was really high up there just because it took so much effort to get the audio synced correctly. So I understand that feeling of completion. Like, great, this project's done. It's it's a whole package deal, too, on top of that. Mm -hmm. totally get that. Yeah. I, again, I mean, you guys have a far more technically superior, you know, setup and whatnot to what I... Uh, yeah, we have a little yellow use. room. And it's half yellow, you room. strange Argentinian man. <laughs> Most people don't even know. It's half yellow. <laughs> <laughs> How's it? What's it like? For, uh, what's it What's it been like getting to know Bruno? Bruno's fantastic. I know. Especially he's very he, specific, he, though. And he, he, he's, sneaky, he's very sneaky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, have you have you caught his mumblings, his wise mumbles? <laughs> <laughs> he's mm -hmm. got some zingers in those mumbles, too. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah. Oh, my God, Rob in the airport. With and that, was, that was hilarious because um, when I, I came and arrived, I was at the, the counter, and I was it's trying to rent a, the car. A, a rental car. And and the text all of a sudden pops up on my phone and says, you know, just... We're having this debate. We're doing yeah. this thing in the thing where I'm like, I'm here to pick you up. He's like, I'm renting a car. And I'm just like, this is stupid. You're a block away at the hotel. Don't rent the car. Well, then I have to cancel the car. What should I do about that? And Bob, so it became this thing. And I'm I'm now trying to drive the car because I'm going to rob. I'm like, I'm done arguing with him. Bruno was with me. So I dumped Bruno at the airport, but you can't just park there. You have to go around. So now I'm doing the big perp roll, you know, and... Bruno walks on in, and as I'm starting to roll away, I'm getting another text from you, I'm like, see Bruno, right? <laughs> and so I start driving, apparently, you just say, like... So, literally, as that thing says, see Bruno, I'm like, see Bruno? What? What is he talking about? I'm at the airport, what the hell? Is and I happen to look over my shoulder, and Bruno's standing, like, right here. Okay, and he goes like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> see Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, the timing could not have been better. Uh, it, was, it was fantastic. Oh, so, in the car and took your offer up. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, this is kind of some more fun, easy questions for you guys to wrap up the night. So, okay. enjoy. If you got to make one change to humans, what would it be and why? To humans? Yeah, that's literally his question. To human beings. If you could make one change to them, what would it be and why? I'd move the anus further away from the genitals. <laughs> I weirdly understand that, and I've thought of that before, too. Yeah, it's not, it's like, I don't remember where I heard it, but I remember distinctly someone saying it's like having the uh, the sewage treatment plant next to the playground. Like, it's just like, <laughs> why? It doesn't make any sense, no. And yet that's the way a lot of What's animal be. <laughs> unless, unless, what did you say? That's the way a lot of animal be. I was going to say, uh, a lot, I thought you were going to say a lot of people. Like, that's the way people, a lot of people are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe they'll have a corrective surgery for you someday, and yeah. you can move it somewhere else. Like the middle of your back? That's what I'm thinking. Oh, like, the, the where, bottom of your okay. foot? Where's the oh, better actually, place to put it? Is it the bottom yeah, of the your bottom foot? Of the foot you just point your toe, and away you go. Heel might be better, but yeah. yeah true. <laughs> See, I'm thinking uh, the inside, like the inside of the foot. Oh, what's that center section called? Um, the problem is if you put the butthole at the bottom of the foot, creepy people are going to try to get that in their mouth. We should get away from this topic. Now. Okay. I'm no longer comfortable with this topic. <laughs> I instantly, uh, instantly want to end it now. All right, then. Is the smelly smelly? That's it. Rob didn't give his human improvement. Okay. Rob, what's your human improvement? Go. Uh, I, I, Don't eat Inherently stronger bottle. trigger fingers. <laughs> <laughs> then they just build. They build even beefier revolvers. Though. That's true. <laughs> They'd be titans. Uh, they can get any beefier than the Filipino cold. <laughs> I'm sure somebody could try. Uh, oh yeah. Is the smelly smelly? Only if Ballastol. Wait, is Ballastol smelly? I think it smells pretty good, personally. I, there's, so this has been a big debate about whether it smells good or bad. I think it smells plenty fine. It's just that, with especially with the aerosol, if you breathe too much of it in it, it's like it's like displaces oh, the oxygen yeah. and it just like starts strangling you. Just don't do that. But, yeah, don't breathe ballastol. But um, 
Dude, what's I've the, smelled the smelly before. Most smelly smell like cordite and uh, I guess that whatever that oil is that they use. It's almost like a linseed smell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's pretty I, good, I, though. I never put much thought to it. It just smells like an old gum. You can smell one. There's one there. I can't, I can't, I'm, down here. I'm, I'm tied to microphones. Otherwise, oh, yeah. I would definitely. This one to your left. I think it's a 22, though. Oh, yeah, it is a 22. That's the. It's uh, although, the I, smell. you mentioned cordite. Cordite does have a very distinctive smell. Yeah. 100%. Did mm -hmm. you ever drink the beer with the cordite in it? Uh, no. I was told that was a thing. Well, he likes ciders, so. Oh. He's a cider man. Did you ever drink the cider with the cordite in it? That's a thing. <laughs> 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 um, have you ever seen a Kami drink a glass of water? There's a joke in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It, it's about how Russians drink vodka instead of water. Is that it? Did you Google this? No, that's a thing. That's a that's a joke. Long time joke that whenever you see them drinking a clear liquid, it's actually vodka. It's not water. Really? This is a joke. Yeah, it's holy crap. I feel like I'm talking, telling you the sky is blue. It's like a weak joke. Hold on, hold on. It's not a weak joke. It's just a thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna Google this. I'm not even kidding. It's it's kind of been a thing for ever since I was before I was born. I know, but, but there's a joke that you can pull on somebody that perhaps you're not particularly fond of at the bar when you buy them a shot mm -hmm. and you tell them oh it's from you, Dr. Strangelove oh okay that's what it is and it's what she said but it's from Dr. Strangelove okay. mm -hmm. I'm sorry we're not up to date on our references which Dr. Strangelove is not up to date at all but but a good, but a good movie mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen clips of it. Rob and I and uh, cultural references don't work well. We're actually been getting along very well at our lack of the cultural understanding. That's true. <laughs> um, what's your favorite firearm or crew served weapon that shares a name with a cocktail? The problem is I don't know cocktails. Martini. Just trying to say martini. What's another? Oh wait, martini. Yeah, that's a cocktail. Oh, yeah, win. That's not crew it's served. still in. It's not no, firearm served. or what's that? What was the? Oh, the, or a favorite served. farm or crew served weapon. Is there a crew served weapon that we're not thinking about that's a cocktail? Shoot. What's a... I don't know. I only know is Martini. Now that you've said it. Vickers? Maxim? No. That's all right. No. Are we so bad something at this? Is there a check machine in alcohol? The, <sighs> some sort of Skoda something or other? A Skoda mean... A, is that a... Is I it a, I'm just trying to think of maybe foreign... Words Wait, that, hold on. What what are cocktails like? What what's like another cocktail than the martini? Because I don't know cocktails very well. Oh yeah, I'm just trying to think of like classic what, cocktails. Rum, rum, rum and coke. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's a gun called rum and coke. There's not, there's not a there's not a cosmopolitan firearm. No. There's not a white Russian firearm. There's white Russians. No. No, no I'm just looking at names of okay, cocktails. Okay, well, hold to make on. Sure Ten most popular cocktails. Margarita. There's not no, a margarita. Just want to get a list of the cocktails. <laughs> Daiquiri. Oh, you know what my favorite cream serve weapon is? It's a pear gin fizz. <laughs> Espresso martini. It's super efficient. <laughs> a big batch watermelon margaritas. Whiskey. Highball. Flip. Daiquiri. Sidecar. Old fashioned. There's not a gold gun called the old fashioned. <laughs> you like that old fashioned? <laughs> yeah, they were just sitting there right behind us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's um, one called the Bee's Knees? I don't want to drink that. Anyway. It's I'd, lemon, honey, and, and gin with we're black down pepper. The again. Yeah. <laughs> that's, no, that's it. Yeah, Martini's the only one. Yeah. The only one I know of. It's the only um, one. Oh. Uh, this person has a burning itch. Should he oh, apply... Oh, you should talk to a doctor. Ointment. Should, should he Oint apply... Ointment. <laughs> Ballastol topically or ingest oh. it? Oh. Well, where's the burning itch? Because if it's on the genitalia... Okay, so do you know this story? Um, are we talking about the medicinal qualities of ballastol? Yeah, we talked so, about it on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did talk about it on the podcast, but just for public consumption. Ballastol, because this is actually so fun. We have a sponsor that keeps being brought up by our audience because they're curious about the ballastol. <laughs> I did not know this about ballastol myself. Ballastol is a disinfectant. Um, the trick is, in most countries, the U.S. included, you would file with, in the U.S. would be the FDA, I believe. Um, and then once... The Food and Drug Association? Wouldn't it be? Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah, it would be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in order to sell it as a disinfectant, they would have to file it as a disinfectant. But then once they do that, the entire thing, I guess, becomes recategorized as a medicinal disinfectant, which means it has to go into that section that has all these rules applied to it. So then it becomes difficult to sell over the gun store counter, right? But the reason it can be used as a disinfectant is because it was built off of medical oil because at the time the German army was looking for a universal oil. In other words, an oil that you could use as a medicinal oil and cut some things like that for disinfecting and also lubricating their firearms and wood and leather. So it's supposed to be a literal universal oil at a time when oils were used as disinfectants, mm -hmm. right? 
So it apparently, according to studies, is actually a pretty good disinfectant. However, a couple things to that. One, as far as I understand it, that's only indicated by the liquid form, not the aerosolized, because this has other additives, and I'm not sure what those additives mean for you. Mm. Like, the pure liquid stuff is so safe that you can drink it. It tastes terrible. And I guess you might get a tummy ache, but, like, it is not dangerous. You know what I mean? Like, if kids drink it, you don't have to call poison control. It's not the end of the world. It's just gross. <laughs> um the aerosol version, though, I don't know because it has other elements because of aerosols. Um, however, if you're like a hunter or something, it is because of the way the U.S. works, I cannot tell you that if you're a hunter, you can use that as a disinfecting wipe in addition to being a gun oil and therefore save some room in your kit. I can't say that. The FDA won't let me <laughs> because then I'd be endorsing something that hasn't been tested as a blah, 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 blah. blah. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. Germany, they do have a separate formulation, which is very different. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That is different enough to be classified as a totally, oh. just the nudge did enough to be a different product that it is used as a dis- It's branded as a medical thing. Mm-hmm. And they went through that process in Germany. So I don't know if they're going to do that in the U.S., but... Given the price of Neosporin and stuff like that, in those little tiny tubes, uh, I won't tell you, thanks to the FDA, what I will be doing going forward. <laughs> so, there is that. Fun fact. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let me do one, uh, change one thing. I'm running a World War One era 5th edition D&D campaign. Okay. May he put y'all, us, in it as NPCs? I mean, why, yeah, why would you have to ask permission? I mean, he, apparently he wants to. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Wait, what am I doing? Am I sexy? I was going to say Kilted <laughs> Rob or Trousered Rob. Good question. Excellent they're question. Pick kilted. I, I mean, knowing them, they, they probably will pick Kilted. <laughs> they want to see you in a little apron. Or, 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 or Rifle Green. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your favorite type of rim jam? <laughs> <laughs> Strawberry. <laughs> 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 yeah. Anyway, <laughs> have you experienced rim jam? Uh, yeah. That's impossible. Mike told me. It can't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, you're talking that. Oh, I was. My mind was completely different. Place. Oh, yeah. oh, your brain went there because of the buttholes. I'm so. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend. <laughs> oh, you did, did you? Who um, <laughs> is a delight. And she was in high school. She was uh, extremely profane, right? And one of her favorite things was the word rim job. Well, the phrase, the term rim job. She just loved that for mm-hmm. some reason. And she would just, I'd just call her on the phone and be like, hey, what's, you want to go do whatever? And she'd be or like, or I'd be, you know, then it was because nobody had cell phones. So you'd have to call and you'd be like, where are you going to be at at whatever day, you know? Oh, I gotta be over your mom get a rim job. No, I'm just kidding. I like your mom. I give her the rim job. You know, like she just that shit all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Didn't see it. Went to college, all that stuff. Didn't see her for years. It's been a decade since I saw her. And I heard these stories, by the way. Mm. So I have plenty of times from because well, other stuff would come up. Yeah. Um. And so I hadn't seen her for a decade, and then she kind of found me on Facebook. I was like, "Hey, man, are you still down in Charleston?" Blah blah. blah. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah." And so, he tells me, he's like, oh, we're going to go get, you know, some, yeah, we're gonna some get drinks some or whatever, and, drinks and we're going to meet her. And I went, oh, God, Rimjack Girl. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, which is not a good phrase for somebody. <laughs> so we go, and she's got, like, she's got fiancé or whatever, they hanging out, and uh, I can't remember what happened, but um, one of the girls like, yeah, you haven't been nearly as profane as I thought. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, I told them your favorite word. And she's going, my favorite word? I was like, yeah, rim job. And she goes the hell are you talking about i never i didn't say that and i was like you said it all the time you said it constantly she's like oh yeah i just went around saying room job so the two drinks in mm-hmm. she's like relaxed and whatever yeah. else and she starts saying it all the time and she goes i think her i did say it like, a lot and her friend is like like going why is she saying it so <laughs> and she's like so we hang out for hours <laughs> and then like, she's like what have you done to me it's like i barely had a habit that i kicked i just kicked it yeah i was dressed like, all the way back <laughs> <laughs> you get, like, every third word out of her mouth again <laughs> That poor girl. You may have broken her that night. <laughs> it's not my fault that I remembered a thing. <laughs> All right, let's take a pause for the cameras. (Laughter) 
Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. Next question. Uh, like nothing ever happened. Uh, best mustache tips and tricks. Go. No, it's not me. Mine's a squirrely, awful thing. Well, that means you must have tips and tricks then. Go. Yeah, the tip is uh, try to scrape the drool out of it every morning. You drool up. No, you I drool, drool in the corner up. and it wicks. Oh, okay. So you don't you use that wicking ability to twirl it. You just get it out of there. My mustache absorbs everything that I come in contact with. Mm -hmm. And also buffers your upper lip from the wind. So you have this, like a really soft upper lip, supposedly. It's, oh, it's tender yeah. soft. Mm -hmm. Very delicate. <laughs> I know I've had it right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got any tips and tricks yourself, Rob, for the group? Uh, yeah. I, uh, wax it if it's a formal occasion. Sure. That's the proper thing to do. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do the curlies? No, straight out. Do you do the poiro? No, straight out. You don't do the poiro? No, no, straight out. You do the poiro? You're straight screw out. Up you do the poiro? Oh, yeah, you do the straight poiro? Out. Straight out. Mine doesn't like doing it anyway. No, it doesn't like doing it. It's gross now. <laughs> <laughs> now it's just sad. Yeah, but it's not wax. If it was wax, it would. Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. It's true, yeah. Um, what facial hair maintenance procedures have you and Athias traded slash discussed? None? Yeah, I don't think y'all actually have really talked about them. Um, there's certain elements of uh, sort of a disentanglement drill after you make out, but uh, other than that. I can understand that. Mm, mm. Yeah. Depending on how coarse the hair is. I I'm would not, think. I haven't, I haven't. If the hair was finer, I think well, you'd be It would be, be like a Velcro kind of hook and loop kind I'm of thing. Really, I'm really yeah. gross today, but like generally, if you guys want facial hair tips, like this is not what to do. This is wrong. I've just been running around with this guy. Um... You need to get the neck stuff off, for God's sakes. Like, I've known so many guys that have beards, and what they don't do is they don't ever trim them. They're just going for max length, I guess. And they don't trim the mustache, they don't shape it. No shape, yeah. Right, and then they're like, I have a nice beard. And you're like, ah, dude, nobody wants to touch that. Like, you're single for a reason now. Like, <laughs> clean it, like, brush it out, get it into a shape that's consistent. It can be a fun shape, it doesn't matter, but it's gotta be, there's got to be an intent there. And then, I mean, even Jafar. God's like, get it off the neck. Like, a lot of people bring it to the jawline. That's probably a little too aggressive these days. People like them a little fuller. You know, come come a little bit off that. There's a, there's a natural line there. You know how fat or thin you are. You'll find it. And just get it clean shaved off that. Right now, I'm the example of what not to do because I've got this patchiness here. But, like, get it off there. The girls want you to be, <laughs> like... Having manky facial hair is worse than no facial hair at all. Yes. Like... Can confirm. Being lady... Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you don't own it already, would you uh, shave your mustache off? This was for Rob. If it meant you were able to own your own dream gun, no grosies backsies. Oh, it's a permanent demustaching. Well, I said no grosies backsies, but oh, he oh. didn't. This is so. Hold on, let's go back to the original question: temporary de right. demustaching. If it would mean a dream gun. Mm-hmm. Like for free or something, or yeah, just, yeah, have, yeah, it. just, just have it. Just instantly have. It. have. Mm -hmm. uh, What's the dream gun? I, I, well, I could figure something out. I can guarantee you. Mm -hmm. Do you just have to shave the mustache, but you can hide? Yeah, I think yeah, that'd be like fine. Go, go so technically, he just said, "Would you shave saying, it off?" That's what I'm saying. I have to appear on camera without it. Mm. But, now, was there any gun that would be a no grossies backseat for you? Like you would permanently keep the mustache off. Oh, yeah, that's probably the way to start. However, that's the most aggressive. I would yeah. argue you could grow a beard in the replacement because that wouldn't be regrowing the mustache. That would just be growing things outside a, of it. What's that called? A gonopal or something like that? Is that the one where it goes all the way around your head? <laughs> yeah, 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 but there's no mustache. It's just like... <laughs> and the back of your head shaved is literally like... I mean, I guess you can just grow it in sideburns. I don't know about that one. No, I, guess, yeah, just, I guess you can just elongate your sideburns instead and just have this. What is that? Well, just get your phone and Google it. It's like an O beard. A gonopal? Is that what I'm thinking about? No, I don't know what it is, but it's a thing. <laughs> so you just have a well. What am I googling to get the? Like you have to shave head. shave your head all the way up to the back, uh -huh. and basically all your hair on your head goes down around your through your sideburns under your chin up. So it's like you're wearing a like a kerchief around your head. So my thing is that if you put a hood on when you have that kind of hairstyle, yeah, see, does it suddenly feel goal. complete? No, no, no. This is like a. No, I know what you're saying, but I'm just telling you that if you couldn't grow a mustache, but you could grow a big beard, you'd end up with a Donegal. Right, right. I'm just. That's all I'm saying. Do you think they feel incomplete with the can't grow the mustache included? I mean, I personally don't know. I don't. I think they can. I think they chose not to have the mustache because it gets in the way of their food. Hmm. Mustaches are annoying. They mm. can be until the annoyance just becomes part of life. 
Because it's a lifestyle, not a Whatever, you're going to end up with a bezoar. Like, let's be honest, enough human hairs getting into the mouth that you're just going to get, like, a thing in there. <laughs> like a hairball? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that called a bezoar? Yeah, it's a bezoar, but you can poop them out, too. <laughs> and we're back to that again, aren't we? <laughs> All conversations. <laughs> trend trend. What's that? Like the longer an internet argument goes on, the more likely it is to uh, it, it, the likelihood of somebody mentioning Hitler or Nazis approaches you know one. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's the same. In our group. It, it, the longer conversation goes on, yeah. the likelihood of it becoming about poop. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody does it. All right. Um, if you could put Crozier in a British military uniform, what style would it be? Brown. Yeah. Yeah, brown. Yeah, there isn't really a brown. Kind of, I guess he can wear like a Jaeger style too. And like that, browns I, and greens. I, I was gonna go. He's a pretty like zippy kind of animal, right? Mm-hmm. So oh, like when, when he it, wants to be. Yeah. I mean, we, he saw him with the wood block earlier. He <laughs> yeah, was, was he's tearing yeah. things up. Yeah. Uh, if you guys haven't seen the hidden 1911 video, uh, Crozier does like to thrash. Like if you hand him things that aren't food, he beats the shit out of whatever it is that you mm-hmm. give him that's not food. <laughs> in Move protest. your hand out of the way quickly because he will. You're like here's something. And he goes, that's not food. So Rob was seeing that because May was handing him little pieces of wood for him to chew. That Josh said over it, he's just like he just grab them and like wave them around and <laughs> throw them. Mm-hmm. And then we hand him another one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't eat this. <laughs> now, one time he whipped a pair of keys and they went over his shoulder and off the table. Oh, he, he would throw them like just throw them. It was crazy, but that has nothing to do with outfit. Probably I, browns or greens, like khaki or green. Well, too yeah. brown is it's just gonna be a he blob. He also looking red. The, the other thing, how about it like a guardsman's like bear skin? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, how would you put it on the head jacket. though? Like, oh, you, you would fit, we'd get it there. Okay. Yeah. It was a little chin strap. A little curb chin. Aww. I think yeah. he'd do fine with like a khaki like a khaki topped Highlanders because he's got the skirt for his little butt to stick out of. His what? He does tend to tolerate. Skirt. His what? Butt. Sorry? His butt would stick out of the skirt. Other word. What? The skirt. Uh, he doesn't saying the word kilt on purpose. The, Thank the you, pleated, The pleated man skirt. <laughs> Maybe you wear it backwards, pal. <laughs> you ever read the, um, you ever hear that guy, what is it, Spicer? The, uh, the one that was down in Tanganyika? There's like a whole book about it. It's a beautiful book. It's called Mimi and Tutu Go Forth. Have you read that one? I'll get you a copy. Yeah. But he apparently he, he was really, it. really into the idea of like a military skirt, but not a kilt, like a skirt. Was okay. it pleated? I don't know. I don't, like, I read like it a while sundress? back, but he really One of the strangest it. uniforms out there was it in Afghanistan from the 1800s. <laughs> yeah. And it was some sort of like royal guard or something like that. They adopted a foreign service helmet, a Highland doublet. And they wore, it wasn't a kilt, but it was sort of a kilt-like thing. Yeah. I can show you a picture later. It is like... It's like a plain non-pleated thing? Well, it looks like an Italian restaurant tablecloth. <laughs> 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 it uh, It's fan. Wow. Wow. Okay. Talk about... I mean, it's... It, it, to, to, to coin the phrase cultural appropriation, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost like that. I mean, it's literally a Highland doublet with this kind of kilt-like kind of garment. Right. And, and, and trousers that go with it. Mm-hmm. It's just... Yeah. Oh, trousers, too. Interesting. Oh, I forgot one of the mustache questions, by the way. Oh. Do you think shaving your mustache off would hurt your brand? Um, Wait, we never got the name of the gun you would pick. Oh, we didn't, did we? I thought for we a temporary gonna... mustache shave. A temporary oh, yeah. mustache shave. Oh, I mean, it could be like that one on the floor. Oh. Oh, Lewis gun? Okay. I mean, something like that. And it's something that, because all Do they make you off. shave your mustache in prison? <laughs> yeah, see, that, that goes along with part of it, right? I, you get to have anything you want, and you can keep it. Oh, yeah, okay. Like, is that... Would yeah, that, yeah, I would assume well, that's the game. Yeah, of course, it's got to be the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why would you be able to get something? Would you, get a, would, you, uh, would you, like, make a faux mustache to put on? <laughs> <laughs> right over top of a... Like a prosthetic teeth? mustache? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have those. <laughs> um... But do you think shaving your mustache off would hurt your brand potentially? Do you like? Do you think you lose subscribers or patrons? Oh yeah. You think so? Oh yeah. Yeah. People hate change. It's true. People really. They he, really. He hate wore change. a different colored hat on one of his episodes, and a lot of our viewers were up in like arms about it, pretty much because it was a bright color back in the day. No, that was separate too. They they just thought like they saw red hat and assumed it was a political message. Oh. It was just a red hat. Ah. But then. Um, I have, like, whenever I started wearing the light gray sometimes, people are like, there's a light gray hat? Like, they just, mm-hmm. like, they, they lock onto it <laughs> so hard. That's true. Well, there's uh, it's certainly my share of uh, mustache comments when videos come up and photographs and all yeah. that. So. Uh, is it part have of you the, ever grown it, a beard? Is it part of the brand? Have you ever grown a beard? Not like that. No, but just like a beard beard? Yeah, when uh, I have certain opportunities that I don't have to shave. Okay. 
Is that growing a beard? Yeah. On a, hol- on a holiday? I guess, yeah. Ooh, I'm just curious. Sure. It's more like, well, it's to the point where I've shaved the, my neck. <laughs> when you get older, are you going to just like let it just go like full crazy Santa Claus? Uh, if I'm sticking with the channel, then no. Oh. Because. Wasn't that, that a that, tradition though? That well, there's that. like a one, there's like a guy that has to have a beard, right? Yeah. The Pioneer Sergeant? Yeah. Yeah. So you could just do that. Well, I just need to get an axe then. They don't sell axes where you are? No, but I just don't have one. Wasn't there a guy that was a pioneer sergeant that didn't want a beard? Weren't we talking about this? Mm. That was the pipe major. Oh, the pipe major? Yes. He, he grew it because he needed to. But as soon as everything was done... Wait, tell the story. Well, it, it, so the pipe major of the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada... Okay. Uh, his name was Ed Essen. Okay. And he, in the role of pipe major, the colonel had basically given them a requirement. What year is this? This is during the Second World War. Okay. And uh, gave him the requirement to grow a beard, okay. which was the sort of tradition of being a pipe major. Right. So he reluctantly, he didn't like it, and he reluctantly right. grew it. And it was full and big. And you can see pictures, and if you're interested, you know, Google um, Sea for Lions of Canada in the World War II, that, that kind of thing. There's right. a couple of very famous photographs of him uh, piping in Italy okay. um, after battles and gravesides and that kind of stuff. And... Uh, at the end of the war, he saw it fit that now that the war's over, then I don't need it anymore. So he literally shaved it off, put it in a bag, and marched into the CEO's office and put it down saying, you know, here's your beard. I'm returning it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. It must have um, yeah, yeah, Must have. <laughs> Apparently, he just did not like it, but he was very reluctant in doing it. But he did it because it was his duty. Right. <laughs> All right, so uh, to tell you guys, this is the last question. What? Already? Yeah, you're there. What? You've done it. It hasn't even gotten weird yet. I know. <laughs> um, Rob. Rob. Aww. What's it really like being with Ice's friend? <laughs> He's very excited by this question. I think we should cut to that photograph. I right literally now. stole his credit card today. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> it's true. And then technically, <laughs> he I guess just didn't he, think I would. I guess added me to that thievery because it was then given to me. I got frisked in public. Yeah, it's true. That you did because <laughs> you had my credit card. He <laughs> <laughs> said it like right there, trying to pay. <laughs> was like, it's like, it's it's like I literally just grabbed it. Ah, uh, usually it's just. Positioning yourself generally, and that's good enough. And then you tried covering up the payment thing. Yeah, that and was then funny. David's and phone then David, went right through your hand. It didn't his, even matter. His electronic beam went right through the thing. It was like, ah! Somehow David defeated you. He did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With technology. <laughs> so, yeah, what is it like being with Isis' friend? Well, it's, you know. He can't answer while I'm here. Uh, yeah. I think we should cut to that picture. Which one? Oh, yeah. The okay. cuddles? Yeah, the cuddles picture. Oh. Is it, so your, your friendship is like cuddles. Well, isn't it? I think we're getting along, okay? Yeah, it seems fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, usually we're laughing and acting stupid. That's true. So that to be fair, I'm I, I will say, I don't, I'm not a singular friend. I'm sort of like a collective. You're a multi-threaded friend? Like, how many people do you, like, if you're, if you come down here and you're Matthias' friend, how many people are you friends with? Like, oh, yeah, the, the entire C. Nursal family. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like... Poor Rob's making friends with strangers everywhere we go. I like, <laughs> walk into like, what, today. I said, I, I'm sorry, I'm beating this to death, but I was like, oh yeah, I gotta go look at some stuff for Like we're just doing something to stay away from May for a minute while she's trying to get like cleaned up and like handle the house stuff, um, and set up this whole rig. And so she's like, just take him out for lunch or something, keep him busy for two hours so I can like get caught up on the dogs and the house. And I was like, okay. So I was like, oh, I'll go get a bite to eat. I'll do some light shopping for Christmas. I want to pick up something anyway. I take him downtown, wander into like a men's clothing store, and of course, like I step in the door and first say, "Hey, man, what you been shooting lately?" Blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, everywhere we go, there's, just, <laughs> there's yet another one of these people. Yeah, that's usually how it works here in the south. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts? You got like three minutes. He still hasn't answered it. I know he refuses to answer because it's genuine. Oh, Aww. that's gay. Yeah. So cut Aww. to the picture. Oh, okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I make Ian feel awkward. How's that? It's, no, just do it. I, I make it. Like, I make him feel awkward. It's just, true. Just with hugs. Presence. 
No, no, no. Or you just go out of your way to say things. No. Do things. Okay, hold on. Have you ever... But Has there ever been a piece of kit you couldn't get so you made it yourself? Yes. So you made it? Yes. You you make kit? I have made kit, yes. Right. I make Ian feel awkward. <laughs> That's a so hobby of mine <laughs> that I manufacture <laughs> on purpose. It doesn't work on Rob because Rob has my sense of humor. So, like... <laughs> <laughs> Rob is the one where you're shouting across the Walmart parking lot, I love you. So then Rob decides, that's funny. So he's literally screaming out of his rental car as you and everybody else walk away, I love you! I love you! <laughs> Until everyone in the parking lot is looking at the strange man yelling out of his car. And, and to be honest... And then you came inside because there's not you actually wanted to go in the Walmart. And what what was the result of that? Sponge. Sponge. <laughs> Sponge is the ending result. <laughs> if, I wonder if we get sponge to sponsor the show. Sponge is okay. If, if they approached you to sponsor British Muscle Leaders, which you do if they brought to you by sponge? I mean, this is a great place for product placement. Yeah, the pink goes with the yellow. <laughs> yeah, right? All right, well, that's it, boys. This is, show, we're, this is done. You guys it? did it. You guys yeah. went really easy on us this time. I feel like there's so many dumber things we could have been asked. I, I, that was all, all, all the questions. I wow. organized them. Yeah. Good job. I'm proud what were the of you. What were the first three questions again? Because uh, we're dumber now. Uh, to be fair, you've got like two minutes, so I don't know if you're gonna have time to. Go I just wanna, we can start the camera. I just want to see if there's something we could have done dumber. Oh yeah, no, was, I started easy on you guys. What got you started in YouTube and no, what sparked easy. motivation? Yeah, blah, yeah. what's blah, the blah. second one? Outside of shooting, you do for the shoot for the channel. What kind no, of shooting? Easy, do you do? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's all easy stuff. I started you guys with. Okay, so I started you guys easy stuff to warm up so that you got your lungs were ready. Did you ever figure out what you would do to improve the human being? What would you say? It was like one was? minute, so we're gonna have to restart the yeah, video if you're doing this all over again. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. May, what was your improvement on human beings? Um, none more perfect. What? No, there's too many things. <laughs> what? No. I'm going with foot butt. Okay. <laughs> foot butt. <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for watching. And patrons, hope you all enjoyed submitting your questions. And thank you to Athias and May for having me out. This has been yeah. fantastic. I'm Wipe your you feet. <laughs> <laughs> what did I just step in? Oh, oh it's mine. <laughs> <laughs>